What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 427. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you make it home okay from the PT? Oh, yeah. I uh, had you know a long plane flight back to, to lick my wounds as I went <laughs> one in five and did not win a game of modern. Yeah, that was a beating. It didn't go particularly well, though. I suppose that has to happen sometimes, uh, you know, when you play a relatively high variance game like Magic for a living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens more often to me than than statistically it should, but I think that's just my lot in life. (laughs) Yeah, we know, we know. (laughs) All right, we've got a really cool episode of LR lined up for you today. I'm going to, or actually, Luis is going to tell you what that's about in just in just a few moments. But first, uh, I want to mention our sponsor, Channel Fireball dot. Com. They are the place to go on the internet for everything you need magic related. That's right. Anything. If you need singles, you're going to find them over at CFB. If you need sealed product, they have it. They have supplies and they even have awesome free content. That's right. You can see videos and articles from some of the best players in the world as they work their way through well, many different formats, different uh, types of things. If you if you're into modern like the Pro Tour was, you can watch Sam Pardee play Eldrazi Tron, a deck that he knows a lot about. You can watch uh, Reed Duke draft, Luis draft. You can even watch me draft, which I recognize I'm not one of the best players in the world, but eh, maybe we'll have some fun and learn something along the way. All of that for free on the front page of channelfireball.com. Uh, please do check them out if you need some magic cards. Um, also the Patreon, that's of course the way that you can support the show directly. Um, it's real easy to get set up. If, if you feel like you want to give back to the show, Great. If not, that's okay too. The show will be free. It'll be here for you. It's just uh, an opportunity for people that feel like they want to support the show and give us that incentive to keep on pushing things forward. Um, one of the things that you do get, of course, if you are a patron, is you get to submit questions for the Patreon question of the week. And I've got an interesting question here from Isaac who says, Hi, Marshall and Luis. My question is about one's mental game. Some of the greatest plays we all remember are those that involve complex bluffs slash reading your opponent like Terry So, which is a he, he was a pro player. Um Luis's head games versus Gabriel Nassif. That's a play that uh Luis you and you and Gabe had at the uh the finals of Pro Tour what was it, oh, Kyoto? Yeah. What was the city? No, it was Yokohama, Kyoto. Kyoto, right? Yeah. And that's one that you and I did that video that's on the LR YouTube channel about. Um anyway, and Isaac says, however, as an as online play has become more ubiquitous uh, where the utility to read one's opponent uh, is greatly diminished, emphasis seems to be placed on strict technical play and highest EV to gain advantage. When playing Magic today, how much room is there for this kind of mental game? Is it always correct to take the stati- statistically correct best play? Uh, what can we learn from playing Paper Magic that we can't from Magic Online? Really great question, Isaac. And I think it brings up something interesting that I, I know I carried over from poker as well, which is this emphasis on reads or, you know, live reads as we call them in poker, meaning like, you know, the kind of looking into your opponent's eyes and figuring out what they have in their hand and how that's actually not that important in almost any case, including the examples that Isaac gave, you know, your, your plays with, with, uh, Gabe weren't, those weren't You weren't doing some like, oh, his hand shaking, so I know he has something. Or he wasn't looking at you and thinking, I just know it's head games under there, right? He was making technical plays based on the fact that if that is head games, he loses the game on the spot. So he was going to do everything he could to play around it, plus maybe taking clues from the way that you had played the game. Yeah, Nassif picked up on some of the things I did, like not playing a land before attacking after playing a spell to represent that maybe I couldn't use Windbrisk Heights and all these things I was trying to do to nudge him in the direction of letting me play head games. And But these were plays that you made, right? And it was it was all plays, yeah. yes. So the, the part – because I think this this point, this question is good. Where, where I think people get tripped up is when it's just like uh, the, the, the emphasis is on strict technical play and the highest EV play. But the highest EV play is not like – doesn't mean obvious or easy. It doesn't mean like, mm-hmm. yeah, like you just play all the turns correctly. It's – Stuff like picking up because of the way your opponent's acting, what kind of cards they could have. They attacked you with a 2-1 and a 3-1, but didn't attack with a 4-2. What kind of trick would that represent? Right, but I want to be clear here. What you mean is not just by the way they're acting, but how they're playing. Yeah, people Like game actions, right? People don't realize how much information is transmitted. And a lot of games of Magic are pretty straightforward if you have like a certain baseline of like not attacking 2-2s into 3-3s. But... 
there's a lot of room for really good plays. Like, actually, I remember one uh, I just read in Reed Duke's term report. He, he made top eight of the Pro Tour, and he wrote a report for ChannelFireball.com. And uh, <laughs> he, <Is that> all? <laughs> he, he was playing against uh, Yvonne Flock, who was playing Grixis Death Shadow. Mm-hmm. And he knew from a previous thought season that uh, – that he see, he knew some of the cards from Yvonne's hand, and then Yvonne did not play a land past the turn with one blue mana up. At the end of Reed's turn, cast Opt to look at his top card and then put it on the bottom, then draw a card. And Reed determined from that play that Yvonne had stubborn denial in his hand, a one mana counter spell, because otherwise he would have main phase used Opt to try to find a land. Because ah, he missed his like, third land drop. Mm-hmm. And so Reed played the whole rest of the game, assuming Yvonne had a stubborn denial in hand. And he did, and that was correct. And that wasn't a mind game. That was just based on the card information. You'd pick it up on right. Magic Online just like real life. But a lot of players wouldn't have noticed that. They wouldn't have thought, oh, they played opt in a turn. Whereas te- correct technical play is to now play as if your opponent has stubborn denial. Because when you play against someone very good, Reed's opponent, a Pro Tour champion, they're not going to just miss land drops for no reason. Right. So that's the sort of thing that can look somewhat like reading the opponent, but really is just reading their their actions. And to go one level deeper, Yvonne could have also bluffed Stubborn Denial by doing that, which is still something that could happen exactly on Magic Online, just like real life, right? He, totally. he says, I'm going to wait on this opt because Reed's going to think, well, the only reason I didn't opt main phase is to keep up Stubborn Denial. Then he's going to play around Stubborn Denial the rest of the game. I don't even have it. Right. Of course, in real life, you you immediately draw the, the card you just bluffed. So Right, that's uh, how that works. <laughs> yeah. But, so look, look at that complicated layer that you could be yeah. transmitted even if you're playing against a robot, a blank wall. It has nothing to do with reads. And I think there's – except, you know, well, Reed was the person in this scenario. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, – <laughs> yeah, It has a lot to do with Reed, yeah. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of complexity in magic just based on the game actions that people don't see. And worry about that before you worry about reading your opponent. Like when I get reads on the opponent – Again, card reads, not read dukes. It's because of the game actions they've taken triggering, you know, alarm bells in my head. Like, it really feels like they have this card. And, like, it really feels like they have Golden Demise. But you can do that off a lot of their game actions. And I think there's a lot of depth there and a lot of counterplay and a lot of ways to level up your game, even within, even not taking physical tells into account, which most of the time I don't think are that useful anyway. Yeah, so the the basics with the physical tells stuff is that it's a very small percentage of high level competitive play. You know, it's not zero, but it's very small. It's not something that you need to focus on. If you completely disregarded it, you'd be fine. Honestly, like you you might even be better. Cuz one of the pitfalls with physical tells is that you will be wrong and then make a play based on it. And a lot of it is guesswork, you know, when they actually break down These things uh, like in a survey or a test type scenario where you can see exactly what's going on with it. A lot of people, people are barely better than a coin flip or even worse, right? It's, there's not a lot of science to it that's repeatable. So, and a lot of it's not useful either. For example, how many times, Luis, have you played against somebody and you're in a relative stalemate, but it's a close game, like you're almost dead and they draw their card and they go, cool, attack with everything. You know, your your sick read here is that they top deck something that would win them the game. But the truth is, is that that's not super relevant because you have to play as if they drew that anyway. So your read isn't actually getting you anywhere. And also, it, it's kind of obvious, right? Like they wouldn't make that play unless that had happened. So it, it, at the end of the day, you don't need to focus too much on it. Uh, and, and in fact, if I was, you know, developing my game, uh, I would ignore it. I would just say, I'm because look, the one last thing I'll say about it, they can, they can do things <laughs> that make you think the opposite, right? Once you start putting stock into the reads that you have on your opponent is when your opponent can start giving you false tells is what we call them. They can right. send you down a path that's incorrect. So just take the guesswork out of it. You have enough on your plate just figuring out what your opponent's doing based on their game actions. Okay, Luis, we got a cool episode this, this time around, a little bit different than our normal gig. Uh, tell us what we're going to be doing. So this episode came – kind of from a, a joke on an episode of Magic TV where mm-hmm. we, we talked about doing a podcast about Alpha, the the, the first set mm-hmm. of Magic. A limited edition Alpha, I think, is the, the technical name for it. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it more and more and realized we really did want to do this. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the show today is kind of like a set review of Alpha. Not like we're going to go over every single card because that would take a long time. Alpha is a big set. Big set. But... This is us breaking down cards 
from Alpha and talking about what they mean to, for like you know for Magic, what they mean what they mean in Alpha. And part of the reason is that Alpha is such a well designed set that even twenty five years later, not only does it hold up, we can look at a lot of reasons the way Magic is the way it is because of things that happened in Alpha. And yeah. I think it's really interesting and a really it's I think a really good look back for people who like the nostalgia of Alpha, people who maybe weren't playing then but playing. <coughs> old enough or you know have been playing long enough to to know a lot of this stuff but also i I think this is a really good history lesson for people who who weren't playing then i think that this is going to be exciting for people you know hopefully for people who who don't know a whole lot about this the the history of the game and it's a little bit of a departure from our our normal recipe but i'm like super excited about it the the reason this happened is because of our passion for it and that is you know something that really drove us to do this and i keep saying us and we but you know we needed some backup here because it's this is this is a little bigger than than just the two of us <laughs> it is indeed yeah i was actually watching the magic tv that this happened on while it happened and and immediately after the idea got tossed there was text messages flying between me and you and our special guest who we've brought in just for this episode the ben sec ben welcome back to the podcast hi how's it going Good, man. It was cool. I was, I remember watching you guys on the magic TV and kind of like, like Louise said, you kind of threw it out there like as a joke, like, Oh, you know, we, we, you guys both clearly had a passion and a love for alpha as a set and wanted to talk about it more, but it didn't really fit in the context of that live broadcast. (laughs) Um, but you know, once the text started flying between me, you and Louise, I thought you guys got to do this. Like I could tell how excited you both were for it. Yeah. No, I, I was really, really stoked that we actually, are getting to do this. I mean, one thing that both uh, Luis and uh, I are, I mean, we're, we're both game designers. And so yeah. what, one of the, the cool things about thinking about Magic and especially Alpha is how the game design you know, started off and how it influences like modern Magic now. And so, and it still does, I mean, Alpha is, as a set, as Louis said, is, is, is a well-designed set and has a lot of lessons and a lot of reverberations over the years. Oh man, we were just looking at it, uh, prepping for the show, and it's just so awesome. I love, I love Alpha. Maybe it's my favorite. Set. Like, I never thought of it in terms of that, but maybe it's just my favorite. Anyway, we're, so we're going to do that. So that's what we're going to be doing for this show. Welcome, uh, to a walk down memory lane, uh, with TBS and Luis, and I'm going to be here too. Um, so first things first, though, you know, we got to do our crack a pack. So I've got an Alpha pack here just to whoa, see whoa. what we get. Where'd you, where'd you get an Alpha pack, Marshall? I just had one. I, uh, it's just, do you not have? Money yeah, bags. It, it was given to, given to us from a, a listener on the show. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. All right, so here's our Alpha Cracker Pack. First card out, Phantasmal Terrain. It's blue-blue for an, an enchant land. Target land changes to any basic land type of the caster of caster's choice. Land type is set when cast and may not be further altered by this enchantment. Hold on, hold on. Did, did you open an Tasty. English pack of magic? Those those words don't really sound like they uh, <laughs> yeah. they make a lot of sense. Yeah, alpha was <laughs> only printed in English, and uh, yeah, uh, that's one of the things that we will see throughout the course of the shows. We talk about the cards. Is there's some there <laughs> some of the cards have some pretty crazy text on them. Uh, this one's pretty bad, right? This is like. Horrendous mana fixing. Blue, blue, turn a land in any, <laughs> any land type. Yes, this card is horrendous. <laughs> yeah, so n- not really what we were looking for. Uh, next is Forest. Whoa. That's well. right. This is a, this is something a, a little different about how they used to print it, huh? Yeah, I yeah. mean, basic lands, you took up a common slot or even an uncommon slot in some cases. Yeah. yeah. So, so brutal to get basics, although now they're, Kind of worth a lot. Uh, next is, ooh, Terror. One in a black instant. Destroys target creature without possibility of regeneration. Does not affect black creatures and artifact creatures. Well, this card is quite good. Terror is an above average common, though there are some pretty gnarly commons in this set. So r- right now, I think we'd be pretty happy Actually, to take that I should be making noises with the card, shouldn't I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Here's> a- <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't- uh, next... <laughs> Uh huh. Go ahead. No, I said don't damage them. These are real expensive. <laughs> oh, whatever. Yeah, I got more packs. Uh, fire breathing, red enchant creature, and it gives. It, it, funny, there's no explanation on this one, but it just says red plus one plus zero. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Basically, I, I actually, re- yeah. Go on. It gives the creature fire breathing, which honestly confused me when I first saw the card because I just didn't really know exactly what that meant. 
Yeah, it is confusing. Now it makes sense. And and in fact, and you will, by the way, see this throughout the course of the show. I mean, we just call that ability fire breathing wherever it shows up now. Yeah. You know, and, and there's a lot of that here. Uh, next card is Island. <laughs> Two lands. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this happens. Yeah, I guess. Uh, next is Tranquility. Two and a green for a sorcery. All enchantments in play must be discarded. Yes, this destroys all enchantments. Uh, clearly a sideboard yeah. card, so we're, we're not looking to take this one here. Yeah, but did sideboards... Ex- anyway, uh, <laughs> next, <laughs> Dark Ritual. Black for an interrupt that says add three black mana to your mana. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to inter- what interrupt means later, but uh, for, for the time yeah. being... Paying one mana for three mana once is not a great deal in limited. Like you, you would run Dark so Ritual, I think, more than, more often than not. But it's just not a card I'm taking over Terror for sure. Yeah, Terror's good. Next card, Mountain, <laughs> <laughs> basic land number three. Uh, next one is called Regeneration, and uh, this is again the progenitor of that term for Magic, which is it's actually an enchant creature. It's one and a green. And it says green target creature regenerates. Now that's a little bit misleading. <laughs> yes. Um, it actually regenerates the creature that it's on. Yeah, not target in this case means the creature you put the enchantment on. <laughs> right. Which is really funny because like that, that text by modern standards is just flat wrong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, next is Tim prodigal sorcerer. This is two and a blue for a one, one, Summon wizard, and it says tap to do one damage to any target. Yeah. If this was back in 1993 when Alpha came out, I would have taken this card. This card was one of my favorites and one of the first cards I ever, ever like opened and made a deck around. So, dude, I would take it now. <laughs> it, I, I think Terra is better, but it, it really it might be close. I, is Terra better? I actually Louise? think I would take Prodigal Sorcerer just because. Oh, yeah. It just locks out so many of their things and is a win condition. Sometimes you just run, end up in games where no one can win, and this card does eventually kill your opponent. The original pinger. Yeah. Uh, next card is Forest. <laughs> oh, oh, we're running it up now, kiddos. <laughs> yeah, there's two forests, an island, and a mountain. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, this one's real good. Next card is Control Magic. Oh, this is like almost a shoe in for the entire pack. This is two blue-blue oh. enchantment. Gain, you control enchanted creature, though. I'm sure that the te- actual text, which you'll tell me because you have the card in front of you, will, is a little different. I do. Yeah, so it's you control target creature until enchantment is discarded or game ends. Whoa. <laughs> I love that, making sure that people know you don't get to keep the card. You can't tap target creature this turn, but if it was already tapped, it stays tapped until you can untap it. If destroyed, target creature is put into its owner's graveyard. I like how this card basically, the person who templated it just tried to think of every corner case that could possibly happen yeah. with control magic. <laughs> oh, it's definitely. like, okay, that one, that one. It basically should have bullet points on it. And, and yes, we'll, it we'll should. see that on other cards because this, remember, this was the literal first set of magic. This yes. was establishing, you know, precedent like rule of law, right, for <laughs> what mm-hmm. these cards did. And it, absolutely. It, the designers basically didn't assume that anyone playing knew anything because how could they? So it, it, it really did explicitly explain what, what this meant. Yeah, and, and actually uh, one of the, the, the cool rule things that was in the original rule book was the cards like beat the rules. So if a card says something, it, it overrides whatever the, rule, the, the game rule was. And so that's why they were very verbose with some of these cards. Next card oh, is Send Gear Vampire. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Send Gear Vampire is a nice one, though. Three black, black for a four, four flying summon vampire. And vampire, it just says vampire gets a plus one, plus one counter each time a creature dies during a turn in which vampire damaged it, unless the dead creature is regenerated. <laughs> <laughs> which indicates to me that maybe and dying clean. and then regenerating means you actually did die, though that's not how it works now. Yeah. Uh, I think if there wasn't yeah. uh, control magic, uh, Singer Vampire would be the. the oh, yeah. Pick, Singer but, Vampire uh, is a. This is an above average pack of Alpha by far. Like, this is. Th- like, you have two Windmill Slam first picks in control magic and Singer and a couple good comments, but I, I think we're taking control magic. Yeah. And we've also still have four basics in here, too. Next is Copper Tablet, which <laughs> is two mana for a continuous artifact. And I'm not joking, by the way. A Copper Tablet does one damage to each player. 
during his or her upkeep. I think this is the rare. Yeah, Am I, wrong? I think so. I don't know. Maybe we not. might have multiple rares. No. Is Control Magic an Control uncommon? Control Magic is yeah, an uncommon. Yeah, that's an uncommon. Uh, and and back, okay. back then, of course, there was no indicator of rarity. So Right. You had no idea. And in fact, that was a, a feature, yeah, people, right? It was supposed to be mystery. There, was, there wasn't even an easy way to find a whole set list, you know? No. And, and, and they, they made it. Like, Wizards, they made it so you couldn't find a set list. It was not intended that people would know every card or have every card. And I remember the Wild West days. I, I started playing, for, for reference, during Revised about a year in some after Alpha. And mm-hmm. even then, it was still, for me, when I would go to the local shop, there's a good chance one of my opponents would play a card I'd never heard of in my entire life. And that was exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I read that the, the good doctor, uh, Richard Garfield, you know, he wanted it yeah. that way. Like, this was something that he actively tried to foster. Uh, last card is Force Field. Oh, this is the rare. So, yeah. Yeah. Three mana for a poly artifact. And it says, one. Lose only one life to an unblocked creature. Yeah, it reduces all damage an unblocked creature would deal down to one. Not actually a particularly good card, though we all thought it was awesome back then. Uh, I think this is yeah, it's really pretty annoying. far back in line b- behind uh, Control Magic, Sangir, Prodigal Sorcerer, and Terror. Yeah, it's funny because cards like Force Field uh, satisfy a requirement that is that we don't value very highly now, but I think that like not understanding magic yet is much higher, which is being annoying, right? Like you feel like you're getting the person when you force field their creature. You're like, ha ha, you know, your four, four is only doing one, but you know, like as far as turning that into wins, it, it doesn't necessarily translate. super. No, well. no. And this was a, this is a good, All right, so uh, you know, we, we slam a control wow, magic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll t- oh, hold on a minute. Let me, right, yeah. Does the winner, get, control the, the winner of the next raffle get this alpha pack? <laughs> Yeah, I might send him like one of the forests. <laughs> you know? Or I might send him the Bishop of Binding and the Foil Thunderheart Migration I actually opened in that pack. So there you go. What? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, guys. So let's get into to our main topic. So we're going to be revisiting Alpha here. And uh, you guys kind of have it grouped up in uh, in some, some major terms starting with the big, the big hitters. Yeah, the, the, the top card here we want to start with is Black Lotus. And this is... You know, for those who who weren't aware, a zero mana artifact, you can sacrifice it to add three mana of any color to your mana pool. This is largely the most expensive card in the game, not counting a random, you know, one-off or weird cards or misprints or whatever. And this was the, like, most powerful card back then. It, it was It was like a... It was the subject of many rumors. I remember, you know, when I learned how to play Magic, I was I was eleven in school. Think, you know, being told Black Lotus costs two black men and, and destroys your opponent's library. You know, just random stuff like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> rumors, right, Black Lotus is, is, is the best card, and it's part of the Power Nine. This is a Black Lotus, the five Moxes. These are the zero mana artifacts that you know, one for each color that taps for a man of that color, like Mox Sapphire taps for a blue. I remember feeling very disappointed when I found out what those did. They they just seemed like basic lands to me. And yeah, Time did. Twister, which is two and a blue sorcery. Both players shuffle their hands and library graveyards into our library and draw seven cards, except Time Twister is the first card in your new graveyard. And Time Walk, which is one and a blue sorcery, take an extra turn. And Ancestral Recall, one blue mana, instant, draw three. So these are the power nine. These are these are what, like the, for sure the the like front runners at Alpha, these are the the you know, the centerpieces of Alpha. And these did a lot, even though they, it seems kind of insane that they could print cards this good. Yeah, no, uh, one of the cool things I, I like about the Power Nine, at least when I was learning Magic back in the day, is they almost represented a, a kind of a level up moment um, about understanding Magic. Because as you said, I mean, these Moxes on, on the surface look like basic land. And you know, understanding that like breaking some of the rules of the game is in like playing one land a turn or drawing one card a turn or getting, you know, one mana a turn. You know, these are the cards that, that, that break it. And when, you know, some of my friends said, oh, these cards are, the, are really powerful. It took you a little while to puzzle out why they were good and why they were important and actually allowed you to kind of like, you know, have the, the basis of learning you know, what magic strategy was and, and how to evaluate cards. Yeah, I remember everybody was a Timmy back in the day, right? It was, it was big creatures, Force of Nature, Shivan Dragon. Like, these are the cards that really caught your eye, not not the efficient, you know, 
you know, uh, overpowered stuff like we we would value now. And what's yeah, that's interesting for for a couple reasons. One is that it was a level up. It was. I mean, eventually, I did understand why Mox Pearl is much better than Planes. Right? I you can play it in the same turn as you play a land. <laughs> <laughs> but initially I didn't. And, you know, my, my mind was still caught up in the, the land of crawl worms and sheep and dragons and all these other big creatures. The, oh, the yeah. other is that oh, it, yeah. it spoke to part of how Alpha was designed and what the intended goal was. You can't, like, from a modern set perspective, you can't print a card like Ancestral Recall, right? Blue mana, draw three cards. Or Black Lotus. Like, these cards are just mm-hmm. so unconscionably better than everything else that it would be insane. But... When Alpha came out, the intention and what happened for a while was basically that people would open their starter deck and maybe a couple packs, and that's what they would have to build their deck from. That's what they would have to play with. In that format, if someone has a Mox, it just doesn't upset the the balance of power all that much. It it gets a little broken when people start trading and buying boxes and boxes of cards and, you know, dozens of packs Mm -hmm. and collecting, and all of a sudden someone has, you know... 20 mox rubies instead of mountains in their deck because remember there was no four of limit initially yes that breaks down but that's not that's not the world that was intended and it wasn't the world that really happened for at least a a decent amount of time as people were exploring what this new card game had to offer having these cards that would anchor you at such a high power level when you realized it because remember people didn't even realize it initially it was awesome it was just this moment of like what other wonders exist out there if if black lotus is a card what else is yeah, and actually one of the cool things too is the way that, you know, Dr. Garfield basically intended to curb the, the power of these cards was via rarity. Rarity was the way that he he made sure that people didn't have four, five, six, ten Black Lotuses in the deck. And because, I mean, it seemed absurd to actually, you know, pay that much money. I mean, buying a box, I mean, that that that, that, that was just an absurd amount of money to, to spend on, on, on a game. And now, yeah, people buy boxes you know, they'll probably buy multiple boxes a set. And so it's it was just a different, mm-hmm. like, framing of how to approach games. It was one of those, like, well, if people go nuts for this game and do this, that's a good problem to have. We'll figure it out then. <laughs> and and they did. You know, they they, they put out the banned and restricted list and, and they, the, the four of a card limit, and those did solve it. You know, magic was certainly still great, even, even though people were trying to get all the moxes and, and a Black Lotus and an Ancestral. But if you start from the perspective of, the only way people really break this is if they buy tons and tons of the thing we're making, then you're probably okay with them buying tons and tons of the thing you're making. Yeah, I, I always I remember thinking back and and recognizing that, you know, this was the progenitor for all trading card this games. This was like the these first didn't exist before. Yeah. And so, you know, we think of those as uh, you know, some melding of a game plus like baseball cards or you know sports cards at the time that were uh, popular back then and still exist but were really popular back then and you know you would buy a lot of packs of baseball cards because they had value right people thought i'll get this rookie card and then i'll I'll get money or i'll collect them put them in a binder or whatever and it was this weird melding of the two but i think a lot of the game design aspects felt a little bit more towards the game side than the collectible uh side because it felt like they designed magic in some ways to be just a regular game. Like what do you do with a, with a normal game, like a board (laughs) game or a card game? You put it in the closet, you occasionally take it out, you play it for an hour and then you put it back in the closet. And then maybe a few weeks later, you're like, okay, well I want to play a game of Uno. So here's my (laughs) Uno game and we play and you put it back. And under that, system the rarity thing works out fine right because you've only bought maybe a you know a a starter pack or two a few booster packs just a couple of extra cards your entire collection you know is under a hundred cards and so you're going to have a reasonable distribution it's only when you take this like manic gamer mentality that all of us have where it can become okay to say you know i'm just going to buy you know two boxes of these things and it was like you said tbs like you know, if you spent two hundred dollars on that or whatever it was at the time, imagine spending that much on Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it just—it's just like it doesn't compute. You're like, why would you do that? You already have the game. You know, <laughs> it's like take it out of the closet, play yeah, it. You ab- know? Absolutely. And actually, the the, the first um, event or convention that Magic re- was released at was uh, Gen Con '93, and uh, one of the reasons Magic got created was uh, Peter Atkinson, the the president of Wizards of the Coast at the time asked 
uh, Richard Garfield for a game that you could play in between role playing game sessions. This was meant to be the game that you played, you know, what between playing other games. And so, but what happened at that uh, at Gen Con was it kind of overtook the convention. People had like a starter and a couple boosters and they were just playing it constantly all weekend. And like, you'd be like looking around the convention hall, finding someone in the corner that you'd probably be playing it on the side of the, you know, on the floor, at the, the side of the hall, or you'd be, it, would, it just took over that convention. And, and it's really, really cool, like story to think that this was something so organic as it was, it was built to be a game between games. And then it became it overwhelmed all the other games. I remember uh, talking to uh, to Matt Place. He's a, a former magic designer, a former Hearthstone designer, former uh, my former boss here here at Direwolf. Uh, also a Pro Tour champion, by the way. He he when he learned how to play magic, his brother uh, Dan Burdick, who coincidentally is the <laughs> the head of the play design team at Wizards right now, called <laughs> called Matt and's like, "Hey, dude, there's this new game. It's like Dungeons and Dragons with cards." And Matt needed to hear nothing else. N- none of us needed to hear anything else, right? It's no. like D and D with cards, and it's like for for all the you know people who were into that kind of thing back then, it was just like, bam, this huge light bulb moment, and it was just it was that absurd. And even though magic is very different from that now in terms of feeling, that is where it started, and that is that is I think one of its biggest strengths. So to to continue with the review, for example, one of the biggest strengths of Alpha is the the top down design. This is what what you would call them when when you take the idea of something really sweet. And then you make a card to try to capture that idea, that feeling, that moment. And some of the cards in Alpha, they, they read a little weird. But then you realize they were just trying to capture this, this essence of an experience. And you, the, the text just doesn't matter that much. So, no, to- and, and, and you kind of brushed over it. But like top-down design means like I have the name or the idea for the card and I'm going to make the card fit that. Yes. Right? And- like I want to design the card chair. Right. Oh, well, what would it be? Well, it'd be an artifact, right? Like, is it an equipment? You know, does it, right? You start to, you think about an object, a dragon, right? And well, you say, that well, best, what would a dragon do, the, right? The, the, the classic example that, you know, in magic design uh, came many years later. I think form of the dragon is one of the best, well, most well-known because it's like, mm-hmm. all right, how do you make the, the player into a dragon? We have now form of the dinosaur, but it doesn't, it doesn't read quite as cleanly. But form of the dragon mm-hmm. was an enchantment from Onslaught, which set your life total to five at the end of every turn. Uh, which is exactly like a dragon would in, in, in magic, right? A five, five toughness if dragon. You were, if you were on the battlefield as a dragon. Yep. Yeah. Creatures without flying can't attack you. And at the start of your turn, you know, deal five damage to target creature or player. It attacks for five. Like mm-hmm. this card is just the representation of the player as a dragon. And mm-hmm. the reason I think magic just grabbed everyone's imagination and wouldn't let go is because it had all the, these amazing top down designs. Let's, let's start with Raging River. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> I love this. This is like the, one of the, one of the number one cards. Let me read you the text of, from Alpha. It's red, red. <laughs> it's an enchantment. It's a rare, though you wouldn't know that. It says when you attack, non-flying defending creatures must be divided as opponent wishes between the left and right sides of the river. You then choose on uh. which side of the river to place each attacking creature, and attacking creatures can only be blocked by flying creatures or those on the same side of the river. So this sounds, ah, so cool. this sounds really complex, but if you think about the, the, what it's trying to do, you, you do get it. That it helps explain mm-hmm. complexity. It's part of the strength of top-down designs is that they can sell a very complex thing because you kind of know what it's supposed to be. And for Raging River, it's like it doesn't affect flyers. Flyers can fly over the river as they please, of course. Mm-hmm. Non-flyers, your opponent has to choose, divide their forces like between each side of the river because you're, you're an attacking army. They don't know which side of the river you're going to come up, and they have to choose. They're like, all right, I'll put – the grizzly bears on one side of the river and the dredge skeletons on the other side. And then you're like, okay, <laughs> so cool. I'm going to attack on all, all my forces on this side of the river, or I'm going to split my forces on each side, but you can only make these blocks. And this is a pretty clunky card when it comes to actual gameplay. Like, I don't think the gameplay with this card is actually amazing, but this card is awesome. When you look at this card and you read this card, how, how could your, your heart not be captured by it? And I think that Alpha had a lot of cards like that. I mean, it did have a lot of cards like that. I think that's part of why it was so powerful is that there are people like the the Ben Starks of the world who play Magic, I think, 98% because of the strategic complexity and depth, right? You mm-hmm. know, ben, ben probably has a little bit more than that going on, but he would never admit it. But <laughs> right. those people are going to get that no matter what 
like what the flavor of the cards are. But there's a ton of people, especially when you're introducing them to a new game, they're like, well, this game has dragons. This game has a raging river. This game has, well, here's another top-down design, um, Lord of the Pit and Force of Nature. Like Lord of the oh, Pit yeah. is uh, four black, black, black for a 7-7 seven, seven flying trample. In the beginning of your upkeep, you have to sacrifice a creature or Lord of the Pit deals seven damage to you. Mm-hmm. And it's this giant demon. And what do giant demons it's, do? It's, yeah, that, that's that's what it is, right? Yeah, it's a giant demon and you have to feed the right. demon or it eats you. Like, right. In Force of Nature, is two green, 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 tons of green mana symbols because it's made of nature. It ate trample. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you pay <clears throat> green, 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 you have to pay green, 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 green for green or it deals eight damage to you. And it just looks like swamp thing. It's just this like un, it's this uncontrollable force, yeah, right? It, it, if you don't, you know, pay, if you're not made of primal green mana, then this force gets out of control. And God, these top down designs are really what sold it, at least for me, and I think for a lot of other people. Yeah, absolutely. And and one other thing is these top down designs, like modern designs, are are influenced by them. I mean, the demons look very similar. There's a lot of like desecration demon mm-hmm. kind of like is very similar. Verdant force. The, like it's kind, it, it's it's designed very similarly. So the the fact that Alpha hit these these kind of top down designs so perfectly, and even today sets are coming out with the same top down design, kind of reinforcing the the ideas that actually came up from Alpha. And so that's that's one reason why you know it's such a, a well designed set because it still resonates the same way. And you, I think that. When Magic has reached into this well, it has done very well for itself. Like uh, M10, I think, was one of the one of my favorite sets all time. And this this is a set that kind of went back to this alpha feel of Gin of Wishes. You have three wishes of Phylactery Lich. It has yep. a it has a Phylactery artifact that if it, you don't you know if it goes away, so does the Lich. And just cards like that that uh, really make you feel what they are and grab your imagination in a way that I think is really powerful because done well, these don't distract from the people who view magic as a strategic game purely. You know, there, there's there's plenty of people who don't care that Jin of Three Wishes gives you three wishes, except for the fact that it's a 4-4 flyer and has a good gameplay ability. <laughs> yeah, a good but upside or whatever. The people who care yeah. about this really care, and this gets more of them playing. And it's just pure upside because... Force of Nature was a good card to take in Alpha Draft, for example. It was a powerful card to open in your in your starter deck. You didn't have to love the flavor to to want to play with the card, but if you did love the flavor, that's just a huge bonus, and that's that's one of the the I think strengths of Magic design or TCG design in general. When you can find good top down designs, ones that play well are, are better. Like you know, if if they print a Raging River in in the next set, they would you know justifiably be faced with a lot of why did you do this? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. kind of nonsense. But I think back then it was perfectly legit and a lot of pe- you know people's favorite card, like TBS, you say it's one of your favorite cards. Oh yeah, no, it it it's it just so evocative. And the thing is it doesn't you don't have to be like complex to actually be evocative. I mean, if if you have a look at Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt's actually a re- it's a top-down design in in many ways. It's, it's Oh yeah. You know, it's it's just it's pure damage and I think like I wouldn't change that design, and and if someone said, "Oh, that's what like lightning bolts do—they do direct damage," I I wouldn't even think twice. And so I think a lot of the ways that Alpha really gets you and really you know makes you like want to see more cards is that you know that fantasy has all these tropes. We have dragons, we have like you know liches, we have wizards. You know, we, unicorns. You want to see what's the the way that they represent these ideas in card form, and and that's really what uh, you know made me come back to Magic, and you know, time and time again. So I think that Alpha took a lot of stabs at things, and I think one of the important par- parts about that is when you're doing the first set, especially the first set of a completely new game, you get a lot more rewards when you hit than punishment when you miss. And what I mean by that is. Even though there are some cards in there that you would not run back, right? Uh, Cyclopean Tomb is a four mana artifact that you can pay two and tap it and make a land into a swamp. Like, not I think anyone's favorite yeah. card, or probably someone's favorite card, but like not not the kind of card that really plays all that well, right? It just doesn't do anything. No. And mm-hmm. yet, when you make a card that hits, 
like Shivan Dragon. This is the original dragon. This is four red, red, five, five flying, fire breathing. <laughs> like Shivan Dragon, I think it takes a good bit of uh, the, 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 the credit for magic being a success. Like, I, th- I think it, of any one card, I think it has the most. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I mean, there, there, there's an argument to be made for Shivan Dragon to be the most important card in Alpha. Absolutely. I think you could easily make that argument. Like, if you want to go deep on some, you know, meta whatever, but just in terms of sheer popularity, that card was the card. Oh, yeah. and, and they and they hit it perfectly. Like, you could put Shiva Dragon to any magic set, like, and it would be a great card to open in limited. Like, it, like yeah. it, it, it's yeah. not too powerful. Like, it's just perfect. And and this is part of the reason that we 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 love Alpha so much. You know, <laughs> it, we're not saying that Alpha was good for 1993. We're not saying that Alpha was good for the first set or good for a new TCG. We're saying Alpha is just good. It is like the design mm-hmm. principles laid out in Alpha. I think hold true today and are really impressive. The more you look at the set, and you know, I, I always loved Alpha as a as a Magic player. You know, I love Magic. This is like very close to the to the set I started. Revised basically is Alpha with a few exceptions, but fundamentally it's the same set it wasn't until i started like studying games until i started designing games that i really looked at all the pieces that would go together in alpha there's a lot of really important subtleties that you don't need to know or understand to be impacted by and to get good value from so we were talking about rarity earlier so let's look at the card gray ogre right <clears throat> this is two and a red for a two two it was common all right, not too impressive. There was also Granite Gargoyle. This is two and a red for a 2-2 two, two flying, and you can pay a red to give it plus zero, plus one. There's also Sedge Shrill. This is a two and a red for a 2-2. Two, two. If you have a Swamp, it gets plus plus one, and you can pay a black to regenerate it. And there's Uthin Troll, which is two and a red for a 2-2. Two, two. You can pay a red to regenerate it. So these are mm-hmm. four cards in the same set. They're all strictly better than Gryogre, all the, the other three. But they're all at different yeah. rarities. They go <laughs> common, uncommon, rare. And what this does is it teaches you, like Ben mentioned earlier, that rarity matters. That that rarity mm. is, a, is a reason that you can have better cards at even the exact same cost. And, and you see this even now, right? In every set, there's a card that's just strictly better. Look at Charging Monster Sword, four and a red for a 5-5, five, five, you know, Haste Trample. It's not the same set, but in Rivals, they have uh, Stampeding Horncrest, which is four and a red for a 4-4. Four, four. It has haste if you have a dinosaur. If you put those cards next to each other, you're like, well, Charging Monster is strictly better. And we take that for granted now, but Alpha d- established that you could make strictly betters. And, you know, there, there is pushback from a lot of people that, who don't realize this. Like if you take a look at a, like Hearthstone, <laughs> for example, <laughs> this is a digital card game. So things mm-hmm. are a little different, but they have a Magma Rager, so like three, three cost, five one. And they made like, I remember the name, Ice Rager or something like that, or... Uh, and it's three cost five two, and people just lose their minds when that happens. It's like, why is this card better than this? They cost the same. And mm-hmm. Alpha kind of established that, hey, it's okay to do that. It's okay to have cards that are better, and it's because of rarity. It would look be a lot less good if it was Greyogre and Granite Gargoyle both a common, but Granite Gargoyle I think is an uncommon, and Greyogre is a common. So you're like, oh, higher rarity cards get to be better. That's why rarity is sweet. It's not rarity isn't just we want to make more money, so we put our good cards at rare. It's rarity lets you be more powerful and more more complex. And, you know, Lightning Bolt's still one of, one of the most powerful cards in Alpha. It's a common. So it's not just about rarity. It's just in terms of power level, but it's what the card does. It can do a, more, a wider range of things at higher rarities. Yeah, and... and yeah. That's really... How bold was it for them to do that, Oh, too? really bold. I mean, I, I think, obviously... You, as you said, baseball cards had rarity, and so it wasn't unknown in the card collecting space. But to have pieces of the game that were strictly better, um, that was something that was kind of a design no-no back in the day. But now, like understanding that you're going to be experiencing like collecting magic in different stages, like you have your initial starter, and then you have maybe yeah. four weeks later, like the, the game kind of grows with your collection and then you you start realizing that different layers matter and in this case rarity matters and i think um w- once you stop looking at cards in isolation and you start looking at them combos and, and and then that even matters and so i think that's one of the great things about like magic and what alpha really really sh- showed well was the game 
can change as your collection changes and your strategy should change as your collection changes and rarity is a really really important part of that speaking of uh, uh, of rarity alpha had some pretty pretty insane comments uh besides lightning bolt which is you know a very powerful common we we see lightning strike it uncommon these days lightning bolt's just a much better version of that <laughs> fireball and disintegrate were both common and <laughs> fireball is let me, the text on this one's a little wild too it's red x it's a sorcery fireball does x damage total divided evenly round down in parentheses among any number of targets pay one extra mana for each target beyond the first so this is the classic you know D fireball it just hits a bunch of things and then there's disintegrate red x sorcery disintegrate does x damage to one target if target dies this turn is removed from the game entirely and cannot be regenerated Return target to its owner's deck only when game is over. Again, spelling out exactly. No, you don't have to rip up your card. So the fact right. that these were common, yeah, we wouldn't, I think, do that these days. But the fact that these were common and the fact that X spells existed at all, like putting an X in, in a casting cost, that, that is another pretty bold move. Ben, what, what are your thoughts on, on X spells at common? I, I actually think um, the reason why I do like it at the common is – what it says about the game itself, um, X spells basically are, are modal. So, uh, you know, when you only have one mana, it's X is zero. And as, when you have 10 mana, X is nine. And it shows that uh, the, the, the power of a card can change over the course of the game. And I think that's an important teaching moment because you have some cards that they do the exactly the same thing on turn one and as they do turn 10. Lightning Bolt is three. But Fireball gets more powerful as the game progresses, as you get more mana out. And and it kind of makes you want to, you know, do things like jump your your mana and, and you know, like with Black Lotus or Mox or maybe Llanowar Elf or Birds of Paradise. And to, yeah, channel. The, or to channel. I mean, obviously, you know, one of the, <laughs> it is the original two card combo. And, and, oh, is and that Channel Fireball? I think that's really important. <laughs> well, Channel Disintegrate doesn't sound anywhere near as cool as Channel Fireball. For it some really reason, doesn't. Even though it did the same why, thing. Why, why did Fireball end up being the de facto? Like, we all talk about Fireball being the original Fireball, but there's Disintegrate well, sitting right better. next to it. Like, every the, every now the and then you can Fireball or, two yeah. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I, I think also if you think about what's happening, you see like I'm using my life force and like doing a fireball. It looks, it's like a fighting game. It's like a Street Fighter, right? Like you're using your internal, like you know, life force and then turning into a, a street of, a, a, you know, a living fireball. I don't know. It, it just feels closer than you mean. You mean if you yeah, channel it? That's right. <laughs> gotcha. mm-hmm. But it, as I said, I, I think X spells at common teach you something about the game and i think a lot of the cards that they, they mm. put at common were trying to teach you tenets of the game that were important that the early game is different to the late game and and x spells were one way of doing that another thing that i i think alpha did in a really cool way and that we we actually see again in every single set every single set of magic is uh their cycles and cycles are cycles of cards that have to do with each other either directly or indirectly. So the, the example card I have is Fire Elemental. It says three red red for a 5-4. With a, with a, if, 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 you were a, if, you, if you're a fan of, uh, of you know, uh, fiery art, it, it is something. <laughs> yeah. It, it, There's a lot of fire there. Man, many of us were um, young. Yeah, anyway, that's a so provocative artwork for sure. There, there is a cycle of elementals here. There's Earth Elemental. It's three red red, four five. Fire Elemental, three red red, five four. Air Elemental, three blue, blue, four, four, flyer, and water elemental, three blue, blue, five, four. So mechanically, there's not really much tying these together. They're all five casting cost creatures. They're all either five, five, or five, four, or four, five, or in the case of the one card of the four with an ability, four, four, flyer, because of course the air elemental has to have flying. You get a lot of value out of these cards. Just the fact that they all exist and you can look at them together looks cool. And again, that's really important. It feels cool. And I opened a Fire Elemental in my first pack of Magic, and I wanted to then collect mm-hmm. and trade for my friend's Earth Elemental. Because I, you couldn't even tell mm-hmm. me why I wanted both. Like, I, it's not like I thought there was some gameplay thing I was unlocking. It's not like it says each Elemental does gets plus one plus one or whatever. I just looked at them and I'm like, of course, mm-hmm. I want the Earth Elemental. I have the Fire Elemental. I ended up trading a Wrath of God for it. It wasn't a very good deal. But yeah. But of wow. course, Wrath killed my own creatures, so you know I don't really want that either. But 
The power right. of cycles is that not only does it make you want the other cards in the cycle, it also the, – having these cards tied together, people like the sense of symmetry. And this is just a two and two cycle, right? There's two two cards in red and two cards in blue. There's also like – there's also full cycles like uh, the, the circle of protections. The You know, there's one one for each color. It's like one and a white enchantment. You can pay one to prevent all damage a red source would deal to you. Funnily enough, an alpha circle protection black was just left off the sheet by accident. But th- th- so th- th- that was a confusing cycle probably. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, – Yes. <laughs> but the, Slightly broken. Yeah, yeah we, but, we call these yeah. the cops, right? <laughs> cop red, cop white. I remember that. Yeah, I mean, one of the other cool cycles was the boons. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with those where lightning bolt, you know, one red, dual, three damage, healing salve, uh, one white, like prevent three or gain three life, um, giant growth, obviously, does like plus three, plus three. Uh, Ancestral recall, probably the... the the black sheep of this uh, cycle draw three cards and um, dark ritual like uh, get three black mana. What these cycles also allowed you to do was define the colors. There's there's a lot of cycles that say oh, okay, yeah. um, this is what the color is good at, and color was almost a you know it's a very very elegant way of like splitting the cards up and forcing you to kind of like build strategies. Like they were the, almost the first deck building tool. It's like oh okay I'll. I don't. I want to put all the black cards into one deck, and then I want to put all the blue cards into one deck. And when you did that, you realized that some colors could do some some things that you know other colors couldn't, like counter spell, like in in blue, or direct damage in red. And it allowed you to almost you know use that as a guide of you know who you were as a player. Um, I I I think everyone's like play group, at least originally. You know, you had the red player, you had the black player, and they were defined by that. And, and it almost like uh, mirrored their personalities, which color they chose. Yeah, I remember when me and my younger brother were splitting up the cards. We would get, we would just split them up by colors because I took all the red and black cards and he took all the, like the blue and white cards. I don't remember exactly what he took. I remember the, the cards I took. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and and the colors, yeah, it gave you an easy handhold, easy identity, and then later you'd realize all these little subtle things like, oh, red and black can't kill enchantments. I remember running into a, someone at my local store who played this card, uh, Ollie from Cairo. It's two red red for a zero one, but prevents all damage that would be dealt to you below your life total of one. So you basically couldn't lose while you had Ollie from Cairo in play, and they put Spectral Cloak on it, which is a blue blue enchantment that gives it Shroud. It can't be targeted as long as it's like untapped, I think. And I remember my red black deck looking at it and being like, wow, I can't ever target or kill that. This is stupid. Like, I don't understand. And then someone mm-hmm. told me, oh, you got to play green for enchantment removal. And it's like, oh, red and black just don't have all the tools here. Mm-hmm. And what Ben said was, is so correct that the cycles, having a cycle like the boons or any cycle that spans all five colors can kind of give you a nudge as to like what each color does and is good at. And, you know, the green is good at pumping crap power and toughness. You know, red is good at dealing damage. Blue is good at drawing cards and being broken. Uh, black <laughs> is good at generating mana. White is good at being the worst. And like they, these, these are all just <laughs> like important lessons that 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 really, you know, were were set into place. And lest you think that the great Doctor Garfield was not aware of the power level disparity, well, ancestral recalls are rare, I and mean, that that mm-hmm. speaks for something, right? Like that that shows that where, where the others aren't, the, yeah, the others the common, are not. Yeah. They're so that common, that is so interesting. Yeah. I mean, maybe I wouldn't put lightning bolt and healing salve quite on the same uh, on the same level, but I think that uh, ancestral recall is you know is so much better than the others that it got bumped up in rarity, which again makes perfect sense. Now, now, what about the the fact that they were still working out a lot of these things as well? Because you just went down that list. The one that stands out though is dark ritual, right? Like it when I think of black mana, when I think of black as a color, I don't think of mana. You know, I don't think oh, it's no. the color that makes mana. No, and that and that got changed. There was also another card mm-hmm. called Sacrifice, which is black uh, for an instant, or I guess it was interrupt, uh, which says destroy one of your creatures without regenerating it and add your, to your mana pool a number of black mana equal to its casting cost, mm. which is basically black sack creature get mana equal to its cost. Like that uh, that indicates to me that originally it was, though clearly things have shifted. Alpha didn't set everything in stone. Red is now the color of like Seething Song and Desperate Ritual, even though rituals of various kinds are also made sparingly because of what they do in older formats. Right. You know, if you, if you were to redo the boon cycle, black might like drain for three or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And, but 
initially this is kind of like the headliners as to what each of those colors did. And yeah. th- you see a lot of little cycles within within Alpha and, and those are just a, a couple of them. And, and it, it is the sort of thing which also makes it feel like the set is cohesive and the colors and the cards have to do with each other. And they're, not, they're not all made in isolation. Yeah, yeah I, like, I really like that. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I mean, uh, an- another kind of thing that the, the colors did was hose each other. I think that's a, a really, really important part <laughs> oh, about... <yeah. laughs> this was a savage part of Alpha. <laughs> no, yeah. kidding. I mean, nearly... So so one important thing about the, the color wheel was you had friendly colors and you had enemy colors. And and I think the way that you they defined that was to, to show that the enemy colors like were good against each other so you know black white was black knight was good against uh white and white knight was good against black and then there was also cards like death grip and life grip which was you know uh basically the same card just in black and green and red element of last and blue element of last i mean th- there's so many of these kind of like very mirrored cycles of color hoses that showed you the colors in opposition, which is actually also an important thing, not just as what they did, but who they liked and who they didn't like. Right. So black and green hated each other. It was, you know, the color of death and the color of life. So they had, like you mm-hmm. said, death grip. Like, like, imagine this card being printed these days. This is an enchantment for black, black, and you can pay black, black to <laughs> destroy a green spell as it is being cast. This action may be played as an interrupt and does not affect green cards already in play. Basically, it's black, black, counter target green spell. This card is not a fun card to play against. But but, but, it, but it's an enchantment that lets you just do that? It's an enchantment that forever you can just pay black, black to counter a green spell. <laughs> like, imagine you're, you're playing green and your opponent just plays this on turn two. And you're just like, oh. And, and green had, had the opposite. It had life force, which was, you know, green, green. And you could pay green, green to counter a black spell. Like, these yeah. cards, these colors had it out for each other. Like, oh look at some of the other color hosers. Black had gloom. It's... Two and a black uh, for an enchantment that says white spells cost three more mana to cast. <laughs> Just a cool oh. three extra per spell. And and circle of protections. <laughs> Be it very also clear. Says circles of protection cost three more mana to use. Though I think that got eroded into just white enchantments cost three more to use. Yeah. Um, but imagine like you're playing oh, you're man. playing white and your opponent goes land, swamp, more specifically. Swamp, dark ritual, gloom. You're just looking at your hand, and now all your cards just cost three more. You just don't get to play that game. Uh, <laughs> there's like, you know, like I think red elemental blast and blue elemental blast. These are both mirrors of each other. It's like one red, counter target blue spell or destroy target blue permanent. Like these are pretty high powered, but they're not egregious. Where when you get your four mana creature blue elemental blasted, you continue playing the game, and the game is still pretty fun. Mm-hmm. But some of these colors, there's like flash fires, three in a red, destroy all planes. Or Tsunami, three in a green, destroy all islands. Like, th- these cards are just trying to lock you out. They're trying to say, like, so, hey, so, you don't get to play. Karma is one I, of the cards yeah. Ben mentioned earlier. The, the, the <laughs> two white, white enchantment, during each player's upkeep, they take damage to the number of swamps they control. <laughs> <laughs> like, these are so brutal. <laughs> yeah, and that's all the lands you had. Like, if you want to play black, you yeah. had swamp. There's no kind of... Urborg right. or like other like non basic lands. I mean, there there were some non basic lands, but they were also swamps. Um, so there was no way to avoid it if you were playing black. But one of the interesting thing I think what the, the color hoses do is it teaches you that maybe you shouldn't be playing monocolored decks because you you would completely okay. get hosed by these colors. So it's trying to also teach you the lesson that you know you need to be more flexible or you need to attack the game in a few different ways or if you did want to be single minded you you ran the risk of actually being locked out by a single color now now these we you know magic design has gone starkly away from these right like you almost never see even protection from a color these days in in current level sets let alone cards that are designed to just completely hose a player who's playing that color in general. Well, why do you think that they've gone away from it? Is it just a gameplay thing? It's not very fun. I mean, that's honestly yeah. what it is. It's like, yeah. it, it's, I mean, as, as Luis was saying before, these cards lock your opponent out of playing the game, or a lot, <laughs> a lot of them did. And um, one of the things that they've been pretty careful about in Modern Magic is they want people to be able to play their cards. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the things that were like as harsh as like color hoses, um, like land destruction is another one it, that really prevented you f- from playing the cards out. 
Um, they've just cut them down because they want to have the interactions be on the battlefield rather than, you know, before you could even play the cards. One of the other uh, things that you see uh, if you guys are done with the color hosing stuff are the, the tribes begin here. Yeah, they kind of have a really small tribal theme in Alpha. Um, they actually mm-hmm. introduce the concept of lords. Um, zombies, goblins, and merfolk have lords like Lord of Atlantis, Goblin King, um, uh, Zombie Master, I think is his name. Um, they kind of have a hint towards having like tribes, tribes mattering, but they don't even like do the same thing. I mean, some of them give plus one, plus one. Some of them actually just give like an ability to let regenerate. But it, it, it really, really does start like what becomes a very, very big theme, um, you know, in the, in the rest of the history of magic. It's funny. The, the thing that occurs to me is there's just not a lot of room, right? Like we have so many sets that have the, uh, the ability to put more zombies, let's say, into the ecosystem. But with the first set, <laughs> right, they made a zombie lord, but like – how many zombies are there in here? You know, it's very few. There, right? there are actually only one. There's only one zombie. There's only one merfolk. <laughs> there are two goblins other than the lords. And, actually, they're not even lords. Uh, sorry, uh, goblins, um, merfolk, and zombies. The, the lords themselves are summoned lord in uh, in alpha. Um, but Oh, the, 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 so at the time they didn't even pump each other? No, they didn't. Uh, yeah, they had a different, uh. a different uh, uh, creature type. Um, and... I I I, th- I think, as Louis said earlier, out, what Alpha does well is set up the things for later. It, it doesn't actually have to go mm. deep into everything. It it just sets up a framework that you know creature types can can matter. These can interact with each other. They're kind of the, the some of the the biggest handhold cards again in 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 the um in the set because there's not that many cards that refer to other cards, but this one happens to. Yeah, you didn't need seven goblins to make Goblin King an awesome card. You saw Goblin King, Mons Goblin Raiders, and Goblin Balloon Brigade. I think those were the three goblins. Yep. And Mm -hmm. that already was like, wow, this is awesome. The fact that this is a goblin goes well with my Goblin King. Of course it does. And, you know, it turns out Tribal, like, look, Tribal's in the, like, last set 25 years later, right? Tribal shows up every couple Mm -hmm. sets. And even sets without a strong Tribal theme frequently have some cards that are Tribal because... It is so evocative. Like, what else do you want to do but have, you know, your Lord of Atlantis lead all your merfolk into battle? And ah, that's really cool. And, and the part that, I, again, we keep going back to is this was uncharted territory, all of it. And see, like, putting these building blocks together for what, you know, is currently a 25-year game. And I think it's got a, mm-hmm. a, a, a solid other 20, 25 more. You've got... All this stuff that, to, that you can grow off of and this like base engine, which is so, so strong and stuff like this, it just, it just grabbed people from the start and then it pushed, pushed the, the whole game in the directions that I think are really positive. God, that is so like, p- put yourself in their shoes for a minute and you know, it's 1992, right? And you're, and you're figuring out what are the cards that are going to be in the first set for this thing that we hope takes off. It takes some real moxie, right? To put in a couple of cards that are effectively just seated. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right? They're just seated cards, right? Like you said, like, especially if you look at, like, the Merfolk, there's what? Merfolk of the Pearl Trident plus the Lord. Like, there's nothing going on with that. They they had to know this isn't enough on its own. If this is all we ever make, we're kind of throwing away these card slots. But if it blows up, you know. And all the the, the cards that... Paired with the lords were pretty bad, right? One mana, one one, the no ability. Another one mana, one one, no ability, and three mana, two two, no ability. With uh, yeah. Goblin Balloon Brigade at red for a one one, you can pay a red to give it flying. That that was the standout, <laughs> right? <laughs> Something that's actually quite interesting is um, when they first released the set, they didn't actually have the concept of expansions um, p- planned, or at least not in the same that we say way that we think about it. Um, Arabian Nights was actually meant to be a standalone game. Like the the backs of the cards were mm. going to be different, and so it was actually not going to be able to be played with Alpha. So I th- I think when we talk about like setting the rules for the for the future games, it's more like using the same engine, but actually um, you know using 
like a whole different environment. They they really intended to actually reboot the game every you know three six months. <laughs> Talk about dodging right. a bullet. And, and, right? and, <laughs> <laughs> like if, if yeah, Arabian that, Nights that, had been printed with a different card back, we'd be living in a very different world. So yeah, that that was a decision that they made right at the time that 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 I think somebody tried to convince them. Hey, I want to play with these with these, and then kind of unlock well, part, that part door, of the strength right? of Magic. You know that it's always been true and will continue to be true. Is, the, the combinatoric possibilities, right? The fact that you can combine oh, yeah. cards of any kind with each other to, to make all of these awesome, you know, combinations and, and synergies and experiences. And you can even combine really old cards with really new cards, but even with three years worth of cards, two years worth of cards, there's still all these really cool interactions. Like yeah. one of the jokes we all go to, you hear this, you know, uh, Frequently, when people are doing weird things like dredging their entire deck or going off with Storm is, you know, just as Garfield intended, right? Yeah, just as the good doctor intended, <laughs> right. and, yeah. And that's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek joke of like, this doesn't look like magic or this is crazy. But I actually kind of believe that it is, that is also what Garfield intended because the, the whole point was to, to combine, you know, things as, you know, as, as level one as Goblin King plus uh, Mon's Goblin Raiders – to maybe a little like slightly higher level, which you know, channel fireball, right? Like, and then then you mm-hmm. go even crazier and crazier, and, and you you down the line we have uh, Sensei's dividing top and counter bell, and you know we have a Lantern right. of Insight and Ghoul Colors Bell or, or, or whatever. <clears throat> and these things are, are are very bizarre, but the whole premise of the game, besides just the the conceit of Hey, let's play Dungeons and Dragons with cards, which is awesome, right? That that I think would have been successful to some degree, even if the rules were much worse. But this rules mm-hmm. engine is so robust that cards from 25 years later can be integrated with cards from day zero. And yeah. <clears throat> there's these all these yeah. combos that no one can really foresee, and RD doesn't even try to. Like they don't they don't have the the ability or desire to test every card with every other card. And sometimes you print a card like Vampire Hexmage got printed in Zendikar, right? Black, black for a two and first strike, mm-hmm. sack it to remove all counters from permanent. All of a sudden, Dark mm-hmm. Depths, a land from Cold Snap four yeah. or five years earlier, becomes a two-card combo that makes a 20-20, gets banned in multiple formats, and that's just awesome. Like, that's the sort of yeah. stuff that just keeps happening, and, and Alpha was the setup for that. Yeah, and I, I love that That even though, you know, th- that's the sort of extreme end of it, in many ways— these tribes from Alpha helped foreshadow all of that, right? That there was going to be things potentially down the line that you'd want to look for. And, you know, if you were the person that latched on to the Merfolk stuff, I don't know what the second, the third Merfolk ever printed was, but I'm sure when it came out, you were stoked, right? And you're like, this is my thing. I get this. I'm going to, I'm going to make this work. And that, that, that anticipation still carries on in all of those different forms, but this is just a super early version of it. Really cool. <laughs> um, some of the other cards that they printed in here in, in, in alpha, which, well, not only has, has wizards distanced themselves from this practice, but uh, they left this behind very early. Were were actually anti cards, which was a crazy practice. Looking back at it now, yeah, so a- anti the original. I don't know what the literal original rule is. I think it was face down. Like you would start your 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 duel, right? You would play against someone else. And I remember I played in an anti sealed league back many 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 years ago. At the start of the game, we mm-hmm. each basically exile the top card of our deck face down. And the winner of the game would get to keep both those cards. And yeah, which and that would happen every game you. Played, and the, the right? original you intent, get, as Garfield intended, was that every time you battled someone, someone would walk away with a card. And you know, for as much as we, we are kind of gushing over Alpha because we, we we're, we're enamored with it, we think it's great. Uh, this is something where I think that they actually got it wrong. TBS disagrees, and I'll, I'll of course let, let, let you get to that in a second, Ben. But uh, I, I think that anti got left behind for a reason. I'm actually surprised by how long it took. Like you have anti cards up until like uh past ice age, like homelands or something like that. I think and Yeah, that, I think so. That the like, Are you serious? And, yeah, to, I didn't to Mary and Fiends. It hung around. And not not, not <laughs> Oh my god. Not only are anti cards first I think fundamentally unsound, because most people do not want to lose cards from their deck when they play a game. Like ah you got mana screwed and lost your force mm-hmm. nature. That was pretty sweet. Uh also, the anti cards themselves, I think, were pretty heinous designs. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, let me read you demonic a- attorney here. This is uh, it's one black black. It's a it's a sorcery. It says, if opponent doesn't concede the game immediately, 
Which, <laughs> first of all, by the way, that's actually unwritten text on every single magic card in existence. <laughs> that the card does what it says unless the opponent concedes the game immediately. <laughs> that's true. That's you true. could add that line to everything. <laughs> yeah, you uh, could. If the opponent that's doesn't great. concede the game immediately, each player must ante additional card from the top of his or her library. Remove this card from your deck before playing if you're not playing for ante. So even they realize that not everyone would want to do this. But this basically says yeah. you cast this card and your opponent now has to either concede the game, which doesn't sound great because you're playing for ante, they'll take your card, or ante an additional card. It actually sounds like there's some kind of sick bluffs. Like imagine this, Marshall. You're playing. You've got two Sarah Angels out and I'm at, I'm at four and I, and I play this. And you're like, well, I'm winning, so I'll, I'll mm-hmm. ante an additional card. But what if my last card is a fireball and just fireball you for ten immediately? This oh is yeah, s- and and you and, and the thinking being, you wouldn't have played it of if you weren't going to win, an right? An card if it resolves, so you're just like, oh, <laughs> oh, that is great. I love it, man. There's also like, <laughs> there's journey. also like contract from below, which I think uh, remains. You know, we always talk about how Black Lotus or Ancestral Recall among the most powerful cards in the game. They're not even the most powerful card in Alpha. Mm-hmm. Contract from below is the most powerful no, card in Alpha. This not. is black. It's a sorcery. It says, discard your current hand and draw eight new cards, adding the first drawn to, to your ante. Remove this card from your deck before playing if you're not playing for ante. But this is a one mana draw seven. One mana draw but, seven. You know, I actually cast this card a lot. Because uh, there really? used to be an old format, kind of the early 2000s, called 250, where you had to play 250 cards, all five colors. But ante was part of the format. And you, you got to jam mm. contracts from below. <laughs> wow, that's but, absurd. So, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the most powerful card ever, I right? think so. Oh, uh, Barred yeah, some kind of un- yeah. unglued thing. But anyways, my, my point is that the anti-cards are also just, I think, not particularly fun designs. And people don't really like playing for anti. So, Ben, I'm, gonna, I'm curious how you would defend such a practice. <laughs> no, so I, I, I do agree that the anti-card designs in specific aren't that great. They're just too powerful, too swingy. They're a little bit too, you know, in your face. But the, the whole concept of anti, I think, speaks to what the game was was intended to be. It was intended to be, you know, you play with your friends and your decks changed as you played. And I like that concept where after the game, my collection is and your collection are affected. And, and it kind of speaks to, you know, so, something that really didn't exist specifically until much later or like or at least wasn't kind of made clear was which is the meta game the meta game changes when an anti happens like i lose a card you gain a card so now i know your collection has this card and so i might be able to like change my deck to to or force to change my deck to really compensate and i like the idea about the game existing beyond the individual match and i think that's a concept that obviously still lives with us now i mean you you you, mm-hmm. you do think about what the strategy of the meta game that's what we call it now is and anti was the first inkling of that and i and i think that's an important concept and something maybe you know in execution anti wasn't the right way to do it but i think it did open up someone's mind to that that possibility well and, and it's a way to talk about like tournaments without putting them on the card, right? Because I think that tournaments do fulfill the need you're talking about. Right. And people got pretty quickly to the to the concept of playing with something on the line, playing with more than just one game. And, you know, I think it does fulfill that need. I think anti is like a pretty inelegant, not very fun. And also it is, I, I will admit, somewhat biased by the fact that the anti cards themselves, I think, aren't a really good way to go about it. But, yeah, I mean... I know, the, the, you know, the, the way I think about it, though, like, is I think it's about perspective, right? Because we think about it in terms of magic cards having inherent value, right? Like, I could lose money in this transaction, or I could lose something that I really don't want to lose. And there's this weird push and pull that you get to as well. Imagine if you were playing for ante. Well, you'd want to play your absolute best cards because you actually have something on the line, but now you're risking your best cards, right? So it was this weird, uh, you know, incentive dynamic where you're like, I want to play my Black Lotus, but I, I, I can't, I don't want to lose it. But, you know, go back to what I was saying earlier in the show, right? Originally, you think about games not in terms of the pieces in the games having inherent value, right? Like, if if I lost the little 
top hat on my Monopoly to you, Luis, I, I'd be like, whatever. It doesn't, you know, it's not worth it anything. Change anything. It's just, all, all the game pieces right. in Monopoly are interchangeable. Yeah, and, and I think Except that, like, the, if the you thimble, sat down... You know the thimble's better, but... The thimble's gas, yeah. Well, it, it, you know, I was thinking... <laughs> no, no, not the dog. The dog's way overrated. Um, you know, I, the thing is, I, I'm thinking, like, if I'm the one of the original designers and I think, okay, these aren't... Like, I'm not really considering the world where these have, like, a lot of value. Maybe a little bit, but not a lot. You know, some forced trading would be really good like is and again remember this is me with my starter pack and maybe a couple of boosters and that's those are my cards that's the game to me that's how magic exists if i play against somebody else and i win a couple of games and i get a couple new cards that i've never seen or that i didn't have before i might be like oh i could build this other deck uh you know you know it, like if you could just snap a button and have some cards move around in that ecosystem, you would do it because it could open well, up the door is, for there, people to discover new cards. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a function for that, which is trading. But yes, and and that probably was plenty enough where you know anti wasn't. And then once the cards, you know, had any value whatsoever, it's like screw anti. Like nobody wanted. I, I will say this: I, I mean, one thing I did like about playing that anti sealed league is it got me to care and my opponents to care about cards you normally wouldn't, because mm. in the world where. You, you know, you can buy Lightning Bolt for a quarter, then even though it's really powerful, you don't have a huge emotional investment in it. But Anti makes you care about that Lightning Bolt because your sealed deck has gotten noticeably worse once you lose Lightning Bolt and your opponent's has gotten better. So it's a cool mm -hmm. way to imbue value on things that normally wouldn't have value. But the flip side yeah. of that is pretty ugly. When you you, when you lose your, really your, your Mahamodi Jin, which I actually did in the sealed league, lost my Mahamodi Jin, and oh, I lost the game no. because it was my anti card. So my deck was much worse oh, in that no. game. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that was they, they weren't particular, you know? You, you know. So, like, I think one of the overall themes that you get from Alpha, and I think Anti is an absolute. Uh, and and by the way, our next topic is also a great example of both of these. Is that they did not really care about what we call like a feel bad moment. Like the, these, you know, the original designers were actually, you know, in retrospect, pretty ruthless with the game. I don't think that they had a really strong sense of what made you feel so bad that you didn't want to play anymore <laughs> and losing a big anti card was one and the next topic that we have is another one which was land destruction which is rife in in uh, in alpha oh and, and we're not talking just like stone rain right which is two in a red destroy a land or ice storm which is two in a green destroy a land or sinkhole which is black yeah. black destroy a land we're also talking about <laughs> armageddon three in a white destroy yeah. all lands or balance which equalizes the number of lands in play and you know clever people soon realize you could play it off a bunch of moxes yeah, and we, we mentioned flash fires right. earlier. Destroy that's a tsunami. You know. <laughs> so look, like, yeah. there's also volcanic eruption. This is card is a bizarre one that we're not going to be seeing this what, one. What again. Is that this one? is X blue 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 destroy X target mountains and deal X damage to each creature and player. Like this is th th these are the kind of cards wow. that you're you're not really uh you're you're not really expecting to see because well, first of all it's blue mass. Land destruction. Triple blue. What? The hell is that? <laughs> That's. I mean, I like the flavor. Again, this is another top-down design. Oh, yeah. If what I told you, you Luis, what all the does volcanic eruption do? Yeah, it's like, well, you can. You're making mountains explode. Okay, cool. I mean, it's, the design so, is bizarre. So in, in defense of all this land destruction and all like the color, the savage color hoses, the death grips, and life forces and glooms. Mm -hmm. I think that what is more important and what I think, you know, Garfield and the other original designers shot for is creating these evocative and also high emotional experiences. And I, I think that you would want to be on the side of making people care, even if that led to some negative experiences, just because it, mm -hmm. it's much more dangerous to, to be met with apathy than to be met with frustration. And Yeah, no. I, I, oh, Okay. Yeah, and also another thing I think that was really important. Um, there was actually a tendency in game design back then to actually have games where there were just races. You, were, you weren't actually interacting with your opponent very much. Um, mm. One thing that Magic actually brought to the for, for, forefront was to actually have cards that interacted with each other's um, cards. So you'd actually have, mm -hmm. you know, Stone Rain, it'll kill your land, or Counter Spell, it'll Counter the Spell. And what the, it brought in a new dynamic. And the timing of the game with, you know, like responding to each other's like spells also brought something to the game where I wasn't just kind of like racing like um, shoots and ladders or candy land to try and get to the end. I was actually trying to disrupt your game whilst advancing my one and my opponent was trying to do the reverse. And so mm. it was really important, I think, with the alpha designers that they had cards that actually interacted with every different card type. So like... 
there's a little bit of land destruction, a little bit of enchantment destruction, artifact destruction. Oh, everything could be they killed. They even had a hand and disruption and like mind twist and balance and hip, right. hypnotic mm-hmm. specter. Like, uh, do, do you think this was them kind of just going down the list? Like, uh, like I, I view them. I, this is the vision I have from what you just said, Ben. Okay, so they're saying, wait a minute. One of the cool things about our game is that you get to interact with your opponents. So then they made a list. Well, how, what are the ways you can interact? Right. Well, we could, you know, have it so that you can kill a creature. Okay, that's cool. That makes sense, right? How you know and they thought of ways to kill creatures, and then they kind of started going down the line, like even getting to the point of saying, "What if? What if you could make it so the spell didn't even happen at all?" Right? Like, okay, the counter spell is born, but along that list is like, well, you need a way to destroy a land. Right, uh, you know, to to uh, destroy like effectively a color or a, a, a part of a a color, and they went a little far with it, right? I mean, there's th- that is a lot of land destruction considering how it's uh, uh, dealt with now, which is that it almost doesn't exist, right? Like the current, well, you know, the, the, the rate has also been moved up from. You yeah, know, it used to be that three was the classic, like destroy a land for three. Yeah, you know, stone rain and pillage and ice quake and a bunch of other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, even for then, Sinkle was a little aggressive, uh, right. but it's now moved up to four, you know, your demolishes and lay wastes and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I think the game has improved as a result. One of the one of the advances in technology is, yeah, people like uh, being able to cast their spells. Plain and, magic, right. Yeah, well, well we, we didn't even talk about Winner, right? Like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> two mana oh artifact that says each player only untaps one land per turn. And also back then, of course, Artifacts didn't work when tapped, so the combo was IC Manipulator. IC is on the short list of best uh, art in Alpha, by the way. I just love it. Oh, so IC good. Manipulator, Winner Orb, you just get to tap your Winner Orb at the end of their turn, untap all your lands. And, you know, the, the original prison decks were born out of, like, cards like Winter Orb, which, I, again, I'm not going to defend. I think, like, underlying all of this, by the way, and Ben and I talked about this when we were comparing notes for the podcast, is I think you'd actually have to be insane to change any cards in Alpha because... I agree. Of the fact that magic hit 10,000 times better than even their wildest dreams could right. ever be. <laughs> right. So given that information, you have to be a lunatic to, to, to adjust a single number. But I, I, I don't know that, that Winter Orbit would make my list of, uh, you know, very fun designs. In fact, it would make a list of, <laughs> of designs I think pr- might have created net fun uh, by existing. Yeah, and, and right, but 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 I but I think some of the lessons that they learned in later sets were because you know, they turned up in these old sets. In some ways, like having like so many like areas to explore in Alpha allowed them to understand what were the limits of each of these things, like land destruction, counter spells, everything else like that. Well, well, totally, and I think that Alpha was a more pure and innocent world, which is why you mm-hmm. can get away with stuff like that. Like, you know, two months after this, after Alpha came out, after Magic started just booming in popularity, you still weren't seeing people putting a bunch of Armageddons and Balances and Moxes in their deck. You, you, no. People weren't doing that kind of thing. Like, if it came out now, sure, we would, everyone would be complaining about Winter Orb and Ancestral Recall and laughing at, you know, all, all the cards in the, in the set that didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You know, like Force of Nature, why would you ever play that card? But back then, like, people just kind of took cards at face value, and it took a while, a little while at least, before people really started getting into the, like, oh, you can actually put four mind twists in your deck. <laughs> right, right. But even considering that, I mean, I, I don't know if you've uh, watched any uh, old school Magic, um, that format. So Yeah, for, I, I've for, watched for, some. Yeah, 93, so for, 94 Magic. Right. So so for, for people out there who don't know what that is, it's, it's basically... Um, alpha all the way through, I think, the Dark, or maybe sometimes Fallen Empires, depending on so, um, Yeah, I think it's usually Fallen Empires, and some people play with Ice Age, but I think the yeah. standard, insofar as there is one, is is up through uh, Fallen Empires, as far as I know. Yeah. But, but I mean, there's a lot of the character of, you know, the, the, the Alpha decks that we're talking about in that format, and it's still really like wide open and really interesting to, to watch um, some of that, that, that format because it's, it really did feel like, you know, as Richard Garfield intended, um, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, weenie decks and there's a control deck. Uh, yeah. That, and the, yeah. the deck that went, I think, undefeated at the, at the eternal weekend had four tundra wolves in it, white, white for a one on first strike. Right. Like, <laughs> so yeah, there, there is some variation there. Right. You know, no, I have, I, go ahead, Ben. No, no, no. Good. I had a question for you. I'm going to kind of put you guys on the spot here. So we've talked about them exploring a lot of different areas uh, so far in Alpha. 
Um, do you guys see any, are you aware of any that they missed? You know, that, that were there any like big portions of the game or big, you know, theoretical parts of the game that they just whiffed on and we had to kind of discover later? Cause this, you know, it feels like they touched on so many things, even if it was just a few cards, like the tribal cards we mentioned a few minutes ago, it's not like there's a fully developed merfolk deck here, but they touched on it. They showed us this matters or this could matter down the line. Was there any big misses? Um, I'm trying to think of a big hole in this. I, I don't know. Non-basic we... land is probably it. So um, in mm-hmm. alpha, the, the own, lands, all of them only make mana. That's all they do. Um, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that you know came out with Arabian, so the very next set was lands that had other utility, and that really has carried on until today. In fact, it's probably a major part of Magic. Um, okay. It, well, it's and, a way to it's, add add con- or not context, but additional interesting you know decision points to your, the resource system because you know past a certain point, lands are just lands. They don't they, they're not exciting. They don't do anything for you, right? Like we, we've all been, are familiar mm-hmm. with. You're unlimited. You know, you have seven lands in play. You draw a land, and you're just like. This is just a, a worse than a blank. So adding right. text to those cards is pretty sweet. Okay. Yeah. So Lance, that's an interesting one. I mean, they obviously missed on Planeswalkers, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do think that like if you look at where the power breakdown is in Alpha, if you were to apply modern deck building, like you could just ha- access all the cards you want and all that sort of thing, then the vast majority of the power is in Ancestor Recall, Counterspell, Swords to Plowshares, Balance, Armageddon, mm-hmm. Wrath of God, etc. Whereas mm-hmm. the best creatures like Sarah Angel, maybe, or Sheevan Dragon. But I don't mm-hmm. think that mattered back then at all. So I wouldn't call that a miss. No, I wouldn't either. Yeah, I, I just think that's, I mean, again, uh, you know, we've been obviously uh, big fans of the set, but I, I'm still impressed by what a wide net they cast. Um, so one of the things is that, that we see... Uh, that is still divisive, I have to say, to this day, especially for newer players that, of course, originated in Alpha, are are the concept and the actual card counterspell. Yeah, no, I mean, counters are really the epitome of the uh, point that I was making earlier about interaction. Um, you know, they don't really care what's being cast. They didn't care if it's an artifact or a creature or anything else. And, you know, they all allow you to stop something um, from even entering play. Uh, but what it does for magic, I think, is even more important. Um, one of the trends now, if you see a lot of digital uh, like TCGs, is there's no counter spells. And one of the reasons there's a case is because you, to to have counter spells in a game, you actually need priority, and you need to have like passing priority, and you need to have like you know like a chance to actually uh, response windows. Yeah, response windows. And this is almost like a, a it's such a complex idea that. You know, we kind of paper over it when you play in real life, but actually when you're making a game that needs to be kind of real time, like, you know, uh, online trading card game, it, it really does show you what the, the biggest problem is. And, and, you know, even Magic Online uh, doesn't deal with priorities that cleanly. You actually have to kind of skip over things and, you know. Well, I know for Eternal, which is the game I work on at Direwolf, uh, we don't have a ton of priority passes and... That is part of the incentive for you know units you know like creatures. There's not they're not respondable. We we basically kind of try to make it so that you you pass that baton back as few times as possible while still having interaction because I think interaction and counterplay is important. <clears throat> when you when you go digitally, it's you'd be surprised by how often it, how many cards and how many designs and how many things you want to do require input from your opponent. Like mm-hmm. your opponent discards a card or your opponent sacrifices a creature. Mm-hmm. You know. It, they, they, these put the ball in your opponent's court for responding. Yeah. Right. And, and counterspell was always something that like really resonated, I think. And, and again, I mention it because I remember many, many people, I've seen this time and time again over the years that people that are new to the game, they think of counterspells like cheap, you know, it feels like a, the strategy I mean, I, that's not valid. To them. <laughs> I, I know that Ben is well aware of this, so I'm really just talking to Marshall here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if you play a Sheevan Dragon and your opponent counterspells it versus you playing a Sheevan Dragon and your opponent casting Terror on it, mm-hmm. like that experience is different. You, even it is. If, even if for, you ask a lot of people, it feels different. Even if the net result is your opponent paid two mana and your creature's in the graveyard, like there's a reason that you you see better doom blades than you do counter spells and that is yeah, because for sure. what you described is true marshall people don't don't want their spell to do nothing and in their mind counter countering a spell makes it do nothing 
whether it hits the battlefield or immediately gets killed counts as something that's you know up to the philosophers but i I do think that there there is enough people who that's a meaningful difference that you have to pay attention to that you shouldn't disregard it yeah and and actually the reverse too i mean there's a lot of players who really like the power of counterspell i mean it's it's kind of seductive oh yeah uh, in 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 many ways and 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 like be able to say oh i let you have this you know and or you can't have that one but it's it's you know you call it permission and and there's there's a sense of power with it which is why i think it still is in the game because i think it's really really important to you know it's it's too good of an interaction to completely get uh, get rid of though they've made it worse in 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 later years look you, you don't you don't have to give it to people for two blue but blue blue one i think at this point in magic has pretty cleanly proven itself to be like a thing you can do and, and lead to good gameplay and still see his play in standard. You know, yep. you, you still play it or sideboard it in limited. This, these are things are all fine, but the unconditional, you know, stop whatever your opponent does. It, it is satisfying. And I, I remember when the first uncountable creature got printed, I think that was Scragnoth in Tempest. It's just mm. five mana, three, four can't be countered. So it has rules text well on the stack and is protection from blue. Like that was a big deal. Like that card would be kind of a joke now, but back then it was like, whoa. Take this, Blue mm-hmm. Mages. And <laughs> yeah, totally. And there was a lot of, yeah, they, I think that illustrated how people felt. The fact that they were excited about that, you know, even though all they, you know, I think it's, it's hard to see the downsides to counterspell the, some side. The, the, the rules on these things were, were a little, they, yeah. they, 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 so, they weren't the cleanest. These, these got changed. Ben, you want to handle this? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this, we're talking about the rules for the whole set, right? Yeah. Not just counterspells. I mean, the, 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 the rules in alpha were, way different than they are now oh yeah no i mean i think one of the more fundamental things was uh ha- like the concept of interrupts so there's actually a different card type in alpha um called interrupt and um they generally were like reserved for counter spells things that produce mana in fact tapping a land for mana actually was an interrupt um and what that mean meant was it was it was basically an action that could not be interacted with except by other cards that had the interrupt like speed. And so it was slightly faster than instant. <laughs> that's right. And 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 the the reason was that they didn't want to have like you know like they didn't want you to be able to like do something in response to someone tapping mana. That's actually the the, the biggest thing because if I'm tapping a land and you go no, hold on I'm going to lightning bolt you, but how do I counter spell it because like am I going to tap my land faster? Like they didn't want that to actually mm. have be part of the the speed of the game. Um, and, and priority as we know it didn't exist yet. Yeah, well, it, it had a re- like. I remember reading so many articles about like how the stack, or, or I, I don't know what it was called back then, but it wasn't the stack. Um, how timing worked because basically interrupts created nested stacks. It's like on the stack mm. because you'd have to. Yeah, they called it. Remember they called it um, batches. Lifo. Yes. Yeah, batches. I remember that. And they had life. The last in, first out right. was the thing. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and, and and there were all sorts of like batches, like quirky rules that basically in many cases were just there to cover like one card. In in many cases, um, mm-hmm. but uh, like interrupts were definitely one of the weird things. Tournament players, if they actually knew how interrupts worked, had a little bit more of an advantage because. Magic was a really, really complex game, and like nearly every card created a new rule for the game as a whole. I I really love that that's no longer a very tested part of the of the game. Part of the skill is not knowing, you know, how the rules work to that degree. Because it used to be these like arcane rule books where you had all sorts of people just not knowing how things worked up till even years after the game was first released, and that was a skill that would get you actual match wins. Whereas now I think that we've moved away from that, which is good. That that was kind of like, you know, not the, not the cleanest part of, of the whole experience, but for the most people, it didn't really matter. The cards did what they said they did and people kind of figured it out or didn't. And I mean, how many of us played games with the wrong rules when we first started playing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and they, you were actually encouraged, right, to, to even develop your own house rules a lot more liberally than now. Like now – the rules are considered universal, right? Like you can walk into any shop in the whole world and you should all be on the same page with the rules. But back then, I think it was a lot looser. I remember, I vaguely remember the rule book even suggesting like, yeah, if you can't figure it out, just kind of make it up and come to an agreement and that's your, that's the rule now, you know, because they knew they couldn't cover every, every base. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> to, to, to look at how, how they tried, I think one of my favorite text boxes is uh, The Hive. So let me read you the original text. This is a five-mana artifact. And this, by the way, uh, 
shows you the, the breadth of Alpha. Like when you were talking, Marshall, about what, what concepts they didn't cover, they got this one right in the first set. It's a mm -hmm. yeah. five casting cost, mono artifact. Five, creates one giant wasp, a 1-1 flying creature. Represent wasps with tokens, making sure to indicate when each wasp is tapped. Wasps can't attack during the turn created. Treat wasps like artifact creatures in every way, except they are removed from the game entirely if they ever leave play. If the hive is destroyed, the wasps must still be killed individually. <laughs> the oracle text for this is five tap, put a one on flying giant wasp artifact token into play. It's so awesome. <laughs> you know, and, and this, by the way, you know, speaking of the rules, you know, this tackles templating and a bunch of other stuff, but this is their first attempt at tokens, yeah, right? Tokens I mean, this is them the during themes of magic. Yes. I, I don't think you can name a set that does not have some way to create tokens. Like, yeah, in so that's the last really cool. Years at least there might be some odd set, but there might actually just be Stone Zero. Like that—that's just yeah. how powerful the ability to make tokens are. People love making tokens, and for good reason. It's sweet. Yeah, no. I feel like I should get a tattoo that says the wasp must be <laughs> still be killed individually. <laughs> it does sound like the lyrics of some like heavy metal song. <laughs> well, it does. Like, yeah. This, this card is is not only creating tokens; it is creating the whole rule set for tokens. So. The, the mm -hmm. reason this tiny yeah. text that spells out all the corner cases they could think of is because there was no rules governing tokens. This card just made no. it. And, yeah. you know, that, that is, a, is a challenge to template even, even in a set that I, I would say did not have the cleanest templating. Uh, we were talking about earlier about the difference between uh, Earthquake, which is uh, X in a red does X damage to each player and each non-flying creature in play. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Hurricane, which is X in a green. All players and flying creatures suffer X damage. <laughs> wow. Suffering is a little bit harsh. <laughs> like, th these cards could, should clearly, whatever it is they're supposed to say, should say the same thing. They're the same <laughs> card, right? But, <laughs> right. So, it, it is, it, it is pretty impressive how temp word of templating, and templating ended up, but it is, makes more sense when you think of the fact that they had to explain how control magic worked, how the hive worked, you know, how all these cards right. worked, because, where else could you look? Yeah, but yeah. now what? What about the four of rule back in the day? <laughs> the, well, there wasn't one because you didn't need one because everyone just opened a starter and no one would have five of the same card. Oh, but uh -huh. the mythical like Black Lotus Wheel of Fortune Fireball deck where you just play twenty Black Lotuses and twenty Wheel of Fortunes and I guess you don't need twenty Fireballs, a bunch of Ancestor Recalls and a Fireball. Like you'll eventually kill your opponent that way. Like right, but <laughs> I'm sure that that uh, maybe quickly did away. I mean, I, I actually don't know the history on the four of rule at all, or when it I came don't, about. It, it had to have come about pretty quickly because by the time I started playing, it was it was not only part of the game. It was there were I, I don't remember anyone who really had n knew too much about when it wasn't. But maybe Ben can shed mm -hmm. a little more light on it. Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty sure as soon as they started doing like official tournaments, I don't mean just kind of the ones that were like random stores did, but. Uh, they had most of the the four of rule like instituted in the sixty card limit, as well as so the concept of sideboards. I mean, sideboards didn't exist with the introdu introduction of the game, but they basically existed with the introduction of tournaments. And so, I think with the onset of yeah. tournaments, that a lot of things became more formalized, like four of rule and, and a bunch of these other rules. Um. We have it here. The tapped blockers didn't deal damage. <laughs> yes. What the heck is that true? I oh yeah, there's a whole heap. Yeah. From from oh. like I think it was a sideboard magazine. This is back when there was magic magazines. Back when you know magazines existed just in general. Uh, you know, it was like a pro tip. It was like use IC manipulator to tap your opponent's blocker after they block because blocked creatures just didn't deal damage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this because we need IC to be better somehow, <laughs> no. you know. I mean, the, I mean, there's a bunch of rules that actually don't exist now um, that actually were there, like when when Alpha was released. So we have the tap blockers not dealing damage. We we've talked about earlier. Um, tapped artifacts don't work. So um, actually, just to go into that a little bit, there's there's actually three types of artifacts. There's mono artifacts, which basically mean uh, artifacts that tap to activate. Yeah, like the poly monsters. artifacts. Yeah, uh, poly artifacts, ones that you had to activate them with mana generally, and but you could do that multiple times a turn, um, like force fields was it was one. And then they have like continuous artifacts, which are kind of like winter orb, where it just had an effect and they just affected the game and they didn't really require any sort of interaction. Um, but in mm -hmm. all cases, 
if you if the if the artifact got tapped, you couldn't use it. Either the ability uh, the the rules text uh, turned off, or you couldn't um, activate it at all. Funny. So cards like you you mentioned uh, Winter Orb earlier, Luis, or Howling Mind yeah, the, the, is another the, similar. These one. were the, the technology was to <clears throat> tap them. You tap your own and control. You know the the, the flow of cards with Howling Mind or, or the lands on tapping with Winter Orb. Well, why do you think they changed that? Uh, it's just not, is it a bad rule? I think rule it's, it's, it's bad? unnecessary. It's just additional rules complexity for no real good reason. You're also not going to make tons mm-hmm. of cards that tap artifacts. I also think most of the games involving tapping Winter Orb or Howling Mine are not like the you know the pinnacle of magic. No. <laughs> you know, so I do, do you think it was good flavor? Yeah, I think t- t- tapping was kind of using, exerting, shutting down. Like like mm-hmm. if you want to look at a card called Demonic Horde, this is three black 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 for uh five five and it says tap to destroy one land pay bbb during your upkeep or the hordes become tapped and you lose a land of opponent's choice so this was a creature that basically you know it asked for three black on your upkeep or it became tapped and ate one of your lands so tapping was used i think to to signify that you couldn't use that something was used up and mm-hmm. i think it had a little bit more meaning i don't know if that's Something that uh, again a reach a, a rich you know well of design that you should tap into, but it, it did have a reason. Yeah, yeah, and 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 tapping actually was the signature kind of let's call it game <coughs> like mechanic of of magic. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually the the thing that uh, has a patent. Um, like I think Wizards of the Coast has a patent for t- tapping, like turning a card sideways to indicate that mm. it's been used. And so I think they really, really kind of like reached into that idea and said, okay, well, magic's about tapping. Let's make sure that tapping means something with every card type. Yeah. It seems an extension of the top-down nature of the set as well. I mean, you the, know. the first thing you do on your turn is untap. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you remember when everybody used to tap by just turning their card like a little bit to the yeah. side? Oh man, I remember people used to put beads on their cards to oh, represent that they were tapped. Oh, that was, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We we didn't get to the full forty five degree tap for for quite a while, or is it ninety? No, the ninety degree. Anyway, um, mana burn. That one took a lot longer than you would think in retrospect. Yes. Like this was a like flavor driven rule. There's no real good gameplay excuse for this. I don't think no. because over tapping. First of all, you just don't do it. Second of all. It, what's like what, what where is this like what fun aspects of the game does it add it doesn't really add no. much it it was just the, to represent you drew too much power from your lands and you couldn't spend it all uh yeah i think does, they probably just asked well what happens to your mana if you don't use it yeah, right it and, and the answer is it will i mean to be honest like if i just if you put me in a room the answer it just simply disappears that doesn't really hold up right like You've got this it energy. Go you got to go somewhere. It might as well. I mean, burning it, you <laughs> doesn't necessarily feel it like it does the best, invalidate but. a a card. A power surge is a red red enchantment. It says before untapping lands at the start of a turn, each player takes one damage for each land he or she controls, but did not tap during the previous turn. Mm. It basically punished you for not tapping your lands, like it was anti counter spells, for example. Mm-hmm. But now you could just tap all your lands at the end of your opponent's turn, and power surge just <laughs> does not do a whole lot. Right. Um, th- that's, this is one of those rules that, that, uh, hung around for a long time and was finally done away with and what, around 2010 or so, um, good riddance, right? This, this is oh, yeah. like from a like, rules perspective, this isn't fun or good, is it? Like there's some minor gameplay applications like mirror universe, which is the artifact that let you switch life totals more, more recently, though. So pretty long ago now, uh, reverse the sands from champions of Kamigawa, one of my favorite cards, uh, you know, mm. switch life totals with your opponent. Like sure. Mana burning to manage your life total was a thing you could do, but how about you just don't make cards that incentivize that and don't worry about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, or or just make cards like that and don't let you mana burn. Like, I guess Axis of Mortality is in or I- Ixalan, which lets you switch life totals with your opponent. The yeah. fact that you can't mana burn, I think, makes that card weaker, but I don't think that's good gameplay to mana burn yourself down to one and, and switch yeah. life totals. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I think that there's some – some of these are, are victims of that top-down mentality where you, you, you feel like, well, you got to do something with the mana, you know. But now – or the the mentality from wizard seems to be much more pragmatic right they're most they're mostly like just does this affect gameplay in a positive or negative way and that and that's kind of how they do it um this one is a th- this next rule <laughs> is one that has also gone to the wayside thank god it's called banding or as Ooh. i guess at the time it, it was just called bands yeah. 
Uh, yes, I guess it was. I think it was the, the maybe the the on the on the cards it was said bands, but it was but called, people knew it was referred called to it as as yeah. banding. Yeah. And uh, so what banding does, Banalash Hero is the classic example. It's white for a one one bands, right? It, ha- it has the 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 keyword bands. And interestingly, no explanation. Oh no. Like well, on the other cards, oh, they're telling us you need to kill things individually, but banning just gets no text no, at all. They, they didn't explain any of the keywords back then, but uh, okay. So what that means is you can attack, you can band it with another creature and attack. And what that means is when your opponent blocks, you ch- you would choose how defending creature assigns the damage. And that doesn't sound too complicated, but it is. It is pretty tricky. And if you band a banal shiro with a flying creature. They can block with a non-flying creature because as long as you can block one creature in the band, you can block all of them. You can also band with more than one creature, but every creature except one has to have banding. <laughs> so two Banal Shiros and a White Knight can form a band. A Banal Shiro and two White Knights cannot form a band. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's tricky because it just screws with combat math like you would not believe. And it just means like if you attack with a 2-2 banding and a 3-3 and your opponent blocks with a 3-3, you just assign 2 to the 3-3 and 1 to the 2-2 and nothing dies on your <laughs> so Do we actually know... On defense is... It was really powerful, oh, right? It, it actually wasn't very powerful in Constructed because it's it's there wasn't uh. a lot of creature combat, but whenever there was banding in Limited, it actually really dominated Limited because it was... Well, I, oh, I, I I can speak to that because they reprinted some banding creatures in the Masters Edition sets on Magic Online a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago now. But all the banding creatures were just absurdly overpowered because no one knew what banding did because why would they? And mm-hmm. they would just throw creatures away because on defense it's even more heinous. For whatever reason on defense, if you just have one banding creature in your whole gang of blockers, you just get con- to control how damage is assigned. If they attack a 7-7 into your like, you know, pair of 2-4s, a 3-3, and, and like a one-two bander, bander, all of a sudden you're, they're just going to lose their seven-seven, and you're not going to lose anything. And that's not very intuitive to people. I mean, it, I, again, I think this is another like mechanic that's very top-down because when you have creatures, you, you'd expect them to be able to, you know, form teams. And yeah. and I, I think it's a pretty natural mm-hmm. mechanic to want to exist, as in like what is you know teamwork? How do we represent that? And so having this mechanic was that that attempt, but. Uh, I think w- w- it basically lost one because of complexity and two because it was it's basically two keywords. There's an offensive version and a defensive version. It, there's so much. I would say bo- bo- both versions are pretty offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But banding, uh, good riddance. I, I I love the idea. I, I love like what you said, Ben. About like it makes sense that my creatures should be able to team up or get together and, and kind of do a raid together, but. Uh, in practice, the rules wise, it's so daunting that you know I, that that was one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm glad to see gone. Um, <clears throat> we talked about lands a little bit ago, but you know the only lands you get outside of basics were, were of course the original dual lands, and these are really interesting because they just made like they were really leaning on the rarity thing because these are just better, right? Than th- th- they're like basically strictly better. Basic they, lands. They did get affected by, you know, multiple kinds All of hate. Light, <laughs> low land hate. But yeah, the, yes, the original true. nine duels, because just Volcanic Island was just wasn't was left off uh, for, <laughs> for, for for no real reason. But uh, I feel so bad for Volcanic Island. Oh yeah, uh, were you know they they were powerful. Like I remember it was very counterintuitive to my you know newly magic playing self that you would rather have a dual land than a force of nature. But the you know, that that is. Eventually, the the conclusion people came to was like these things are busted. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, nothing goes wrong with them being busted. It just means people can play their spells. And yeah, I think it's a it's a great place to put power. I think like having the dual lands be just like the very clean, original, awesome feeling version. Like it felt good to play underground sea in your blue black deck. It felt good to play Taiga and cast a Curd Ape. You know, so mm-hmm. th- this was a very good use of uh, some power points here. I, I really like how dual lands came out. Yeah, no. yeah. It's also cool that they set the stage, right? I mean, how many versions of these do we have now? Oh, right? millions. And uh, you know, they have to get right. inventive with the different drawbacks yeah. and mechanics because I think that the duel started at about the top that you can start. <laughs> but that that's right. Cool. Plus, they're super evocative. Like, you know, a taiga is a wooded mountain, and I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. You know, it, again, the top down they just crush so hard on these things. Yeah, I would say volcanic and tropicons were maybe not quite as imaginative as some of the rest, but like tundra is just so perfect. You know, badlands just feels like where swamps and mountains would meet, and 
you know, we keep going back to this because it's just that important. Like the game feeling good is just so much, so much a part of why the game is appealing. Yeah. Um, you know, I put you guys on the spot earlier, uh, to ask about, you know, uh, what, what, what could alpha have done better, but let's narrow that conversation down a little bit here. Cause like we talked about some of the stuff that like we thought anti wasn't so great. There was some rule stuff, but this is the, the real crux of this, which is if you had to remove a single card from alpha, what would it be? And I'm making you do this because I agree with you, Luis. I, if given the choice, I wouldn't change nothing because it ended up being so good that I'm just going to be results oriented and say, there may be some argument that any one card shifts this too much. And I'm just like, this is beyond all expectations, but I'm putting on the spot and I want both of you guys to choose one card that you would remove from alpha, you know, that you think is maybe a net negative or just such a bad design that it shouldn't be in there or, or whatever. So Luis, do you want to go first? Yeah, I I think I would remove winter orb. I I think that Mm. the, the additional depth of prison decks where you lock your opponent out and they can't do anything. I, I have trouble imagining like that is the key fun that magic needed. (laughs) There's just so much Mm -hmm. going on in magic and so much awesome stuff that a card that just slows the game down to a complete crawl, just, doesn't do it for me, and knowing that you can combine it with Icy Manipulator, which on neither card does it hint to that, is not, right. I, you know, not that fun. And it's so one sided at that point that I, I think that Winter Orb would would be would be my target here. Mm. Okay, uh, Ben, what do you think? It's really tough. Wooden Sphere, it's got to go. <laughs> Sunglasses of Urza, OP. No, I mean, like I kind of like these like weird one offs. I, I think um, mm-hmm. that. The, the the cards that I, I I'm gravitating towards are ones that lo- I mean just like Louis chose Winter Orb, I think Cyclopean Tomb is kind of one that like locked out like I remember getting locked out by that card sometimes and it was just miserable. Um, it it turns your lands into swamps. Right. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. This is a it's it's supposed to cost four, and it says two. Oh, yeah, turn any no, one no. non swamp land into a swamp during upkeep. So it's on their next upkeep, I think, or maybe just on your upkeep. I don't even know. You mark the changed lands with tokens, and then if it's destroyed, you remove one token of your choice every turn, the, the, returning that land to its original nature. So it slowly unswampifies, slowly drains the swamp. Uh, <laughs> but it, <laughs> and, and you said it's supposed to be four, but hilariously just has no mana cost on it. It's yes. Just, <laughs> which they could actually print now, and it wouldn't be very good. I guess ben, what Ben said is true. It would eventually lock your opponent out. I think that that mm-hmm. card doesn't... Again, the, the, the games where Cyclopean Tomb is good feels like not the best kind of games and most of the games it just doesn't like doesn't really do a whole lot yeah i i guess the other one if if i maybe stasis i mean i kind of love the story that stasis has in magic's lore i mean there was a time where stasis was actually one of the best decks in um type 2 which is the equivalent of standard back then but um before that i mean stasis just like you just basically had to hope to draw an island every turn just to keep it up because well, can you read it? Uh, maybe somebody doesn't know. Oh, yes. Yeah. So does. let me just bring it up here. Sorry. I can read yes. it for you. It's, it's one in a blue enchantment. It says, players do not get an <laughs> untap phase. <laughs> Pay blue during your upkeep or stasis is destroyed. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so how did you abuse this? So, I mean, how it eventually became abused was there were just uh, like ways to either bounce stasis back to your hand at the end of turn or you would um, like – be able to like play islands for the rest of the of, of time basically because you were able to uh, like, like Howling Mine was a card that got that, that got uh, played alongside Stasis so you just hit your land drop every turn mm, I see and then at some point it would go away but you would have all your mana yeah especially right. you you yeah. would bounce or destroy it at the end of their turn so that you got to untap and then and then replay it and, then and, you, and lock them yeah. out I see yeah I I can see you guys both pick two similar cards like these. This is not like, fun, I, right? I, I I think if Ben and I wanted to make the the highest EV play and or take the coward's way out, we would just take out whatever card we thought was the least impactful because that <laughs> yeah. changes history the most. But that's not the interesting answer. It's not it's not interesting to say like I would take jump out or I would take you know like uh, power leak out these cards that like yeah. people didn't really play because they're not that interesting. But we, we both took like Winter Orb and Stasis were just tier one cards in, in, in multiple decks. <laughs> Highly recognizable. I like it. You guys had some guts there. <laughs> also, we, we obviously could talk about this for a whole show worth, but you know, Stasis has perhaps uh, one of the most recognizable artworks ever. 
uh, and also shows the massive departure that Magic has had artwork wise from back then, where they had a very wide range of artists and artwork that would get put in. I mean, Stasis, I, I have no idea what's happening. It's like a guy and a wolf wearing a, you know, blindfold on a teeter totter with like a, I mean, it's just absurd. Right. But, you know, these are the type of things I think that drew in a very wide audience where some of it was more fantasy specific stuff. Um, you know, like, Hey, it's a, it's a dragon, right? But some of it was this absurdity, this weird random stuff, but it just clicked with a certain group of people. Now things are, you know, highly, uh, you know, they're more on the nose. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Which, you know, I get it. Like Brandy, you know, I've had this conversation many times. Like we all think that alpha art is the best ever. Like we look at these cards and it's just like, wow, this just gets us going. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the art quality has gone up. Like, if you look at some of the old pictures from Alpha, like oh, there's some really bad ones. There's some oh, yeah. pretty bad ones. What's the worst one? Very, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of. I mean, there's some ones I really what, like. But, what do you guys think about Word of Command? <laughs> yeah, Word of Command is probably the, the actual worst one. But I think it's, it's as not a piece ex- of art. It's, it's just, not exactly high. Like, high what concept. happened with Word of Command is it got let, the art got slipped through the cracks. Like there wasn't art for it. So uh, mm-hmm. Jesper Mirfer is the Art director at the time just drew it in like half an hour. I don't even know what it took he half just, an hour. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> two eyes. Like if you're just listening to the podcast, you should look it up. It's absurd. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I think like there, just some of the art is like some of the art's awesome. Like Dwarven Demolition Team and Thought Lace, I think are just really sweet pieces of art. But like, you know, you look at like Earth Elemental and I, I, I think it's like – or, or Hill, <laughs> Hill Giant and it's just like – I think Green Ward is the worst. <laughs> the wards are all like, pretty. It's a piece yeah. of pretty plankton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I liked that at the time, at least. I, I liked that there was a big variety, you know, in that. And especially with the styles. That's the thing that they missed out now, right? Is just that <clears throat> there's much less diversity of styles than there was then. But mm-hmm. anyway, like I said, we could talk about that forever. Um, a couple of, I, I wanted to uh, give you guys a chance to bring up any, any cards. Um, you know, that you, like, we just mentioned word of command. I know somebody wanted to talk about that. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say that this is one of the weirdest cards and it it doesn't really actually work within magic's rules. So the original Mm -hmm. wording, it's black, black for an instant. It says you, you may look at opponent's hand. I don't know why it says may. I I assume you want to do this because you cast your spell, but it says (laughs) you, you may look at opponent's hand and choose any card opponent can legally play using mana from his or her mana pool or lands. Opponent must play this card immediately. You make all decisions it calls for. The spell may not be countered after you've looked at opponent's hand. So <laughs> the oracle text is – so basically it's black, black. You mind slaver them for one spell. The mm-hmm. oracle text is a little bit different. It says look at target opponent's hand and choose a card from it. You control that player until word of command finishes resolving. That player so plays weird. that card as able. If able – while doing so, the player can activate mana abilities only if they're from lands he or she controls and only if the mana they s- produce is spent to activate other mana abilities of lands he or she controls and or play that card. If the chosen uh, card is cast as a spell, you control that player while that spell is resolving. So absurd. Yeah, this, right. this card basically doesn't work, I don't think. Because like, any <laughs> right. card they could cast – like if, if you cast it and they have an instance, they'll just cast the instance in response and mm-hmm. tap out for them. If you, It's really hard to cast it. Like basically they have to leave their main phase and you cast it and then you can snag a sorcery from there. Right. Yeah. It's I, again, I think this is just one of the pitfalls of, of that extreme top down nature of how they design cards. Yeah, basically right? like, Cause somebody just said, would it be about cool? How it works later. Right. Wouldn't it be cool if, if I got to cast one of your spells, right? Like I got to steal and cast one of your spells. That's cool. And then they're like, yeah, just write it out. You know, just explain <laughs> what it does on the card. But you know, at some point, the the you know, we wanted to be a little more scrupulous with the rules, and and this doesn't really fit. Well, the, the funny thing is, like, they obviously went back to that well with with Mind Slaver and uh, Emrakul, um, mm-hmm. and 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 they've kind of skipped over all the rules text with that with those cards too, because they they just say you control the turn, and I think they yeah they they just hope that like either the back end rules deals with most of the problems or you know in most cases you just do something normal like you know you just untap attack your opponent or something like that make bad blocks whatever it, it it's yeah it's, it's 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 one of those things where it was such a cool idea that magic did go back to it it took a long time actually before um they went yeah. to mind slaver but they did go back to it <clears throat> well it's really mm-hmm. funny i think about that is in alpha and 
you know, to some sense beyond, but really in alpha, you, you saw this of like, let's do this cool thing. Who cares how it works? And then I think for a number of years, Magic kind of got scared and dialed back of like, no, that doesn't work under the rules. We can't do that. And then eventually it's like, no, we have the technology. Let's do the cool thing. <laughs> so right. I, I, I am very strong in favor of just doing the cool thing. Yeah. Now, one of the really cool things you could do in alpha was throw your cards at your opponent's <laughs> cards and <laughs> for, for value. Uh, Chaos Orb, one of the coolest cards ever, uh, was printed in alpha. And uh, understandably, uh, they don't print cards like this anymore because they require physical dexterity, which isn't really part of the skill set for, for a magic player. But man, I, I mean, Chaos Orb was on my short list back in the day. Oh, this is a two mana artifact. If you don't know what this is, I guess I don't blame you, but I kind of do because this is just one of the coolest oh, I cards pity in magic. You if you don't know what this is. It looks mana. awesome too. Oh yeah. I made a pumpkin that looked like a Chaos Orb. I actually posted it on Twitter. <laughs> for, it was for good. Halloween. Yeah, I thought it was I good. I liked it. I was impressed, man. Uh, it's two mana artifact. You can pay one and flip Chaos Orb onto the playing area from a height of at least one foot. Chaos Orb must turn completely over at least once or it is discarded with no effect. When Chaos Orb lands, any cards in play that it touches are destroyed, as is the Chaos Orb. So, so actually, when I uh, started playing, um, my playgroup had a bunch of Chaos Orbs. Like, they, they loved this card. Like, everybody had um, a Chaos Orb. And we used to play Magic after kind of like we had a trading night and then we used to go to this Chinese restaurant where we used to play Magic like while eating dinner. And the way that we'd play is we'd have to spread the cards so far away from each other. In, in fact, some people put them on like like ledges on the wall and like just to avoid <laughs> getting hit by a chaos or like getting more than a one for one. It was hilarious. This is the silliest. <laughs> oh, man, the, the veterans funny. of chaos or like you can see it, they're scarred. They, just, none of their cards touch their other cards. Like <laughs> you, you, if, you've ever, if you ever watched Patrick Chapin lay out his lands, it's like that is a man who's yes. been chaos or before. <laughs> no kidding. And of course, you know, there, there was an urban legend, you know, about that this card spawned where, the the legend being that people would tear it into pieces. I don't know if this actually happened, but I believe it did because I think the world I, is a I, better I, place. I choose yeah. I choose to believe it did, and I don't really care if it actually happened or not. I just think that's cool. Yeah. You know, it's just a neat idea or whatever. Um but this I actually have an unlimited one of these that my friend Drew got me for my birthday a number of years back. I still have it. I just the, the, this and uh, Time Vault were two of my absolute favorite cards. I'm a huge Mark Tadine fan. He did the artwork for both of them, and uh, I have I have a, a Time Vault and a, and a Chaos Orb still because th those were I just I was just infatuated with these cards, even though I never played them. Like the, I, when I played, the Chaos Orb was long gone, never legal, uh, you know, at all. Even when I played back in the day when I was just messing around or whatever. But another card I want to call out, by the way, it, when it comes to Alpha doing everything. Alpha, mm -hmm. Alpha did morph. <laughs> yes, this is actually what? my favorite card. <laughs> it, well, what's the morph card? It's called it's Illusionary, Illusionary Mask. Illusionary Mask. It's two mana. It's a poly artifact. You can just use it as many times as you want. It says, X, you can summon a creature face down so your opponent doesn't know what it is. The X cost can be any amount of mana, even zero. It serves to hide the true casting cost of the creature, which you <laughs> still have to spend. As soon as the face down creature receives damage, deals damage, or is tapped. See, tapped means something. You must turn it face up. Basically, you get to play anything as a morph and, and you can face it up for zero. It actually combines well with morphs, I believe. You can just play them for their casting cost and then unmorph them for free. <laughs> so so you, so you the X that you pay has to be at least the card's mana cost? Well, the X is in addition to its card's mana cost. So like if you paid a two mana card you, and you spent two mana on it, X is zero. But if you spent four, X is two. It's wow, just like concealment hilarious. mana. And again, this is like... Imagine if you could summon your creatures so that your opponent didn't know what they did. And that's just Illusionary Mouse. They did morph in set one. Like set God, one. Ah, <laughs> that's insane. That yeah. is so cool. Well, one of the cards... Oh, go ahead, Ben. No, 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 yeah, no. This card? I, I just really like this card. And and actually, for the longest time, I had no idea how it worked. Like, I, I owned it. I had it in my collection. And it just sat in... Me. <laughs> it sat in my binder like for the longest time. And I, I it was, it's just a card that is so evocative that I was just happy to own it. And it, 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 I never played this card, but it was uh, just uh, something that really, really kind of like drew me into the game. One of the cards I, I wanted to mention uh, quickly is Animate Wall, uh, mainly because of the artwork where there's this like grumpy wall with a face that's like apparently scaring this woman who's you know running away from it. But it's like they, they gave a <laughs> lot got, of- like tiny little legs. <laughs> little, little legs and arms on <laughs> the <Right>. side. <laughs> They, I, I don't know, like, 
It's interesting because, you know, we've been talking so much this episode about what a great job they did exploring all these different spaces. Let me read the text of anime. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. This is a white enchant wall, just called single white mana. Target wall can now attack. Target wall's power and toughness are unchanged, even if it's power of zero. (laughs) I I can imagine a parenthesis. If you put this on a zero power wall, you're an idiot. You suck, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because even though uh, Magic did end up coming back to Defenders Matter, you know, themes or whatever in different sets, um, you know, they, they did go very wide. They cast a super wide net in, in Alpha. And this is a card that kind of illustrates that to me as something that didn't really catch, right? Like walls didn't end up being a, a big part of Magic even in the early days. And, and animating a wall was an extremely side strategy that didn't didn't end up being really a thing, but I really appreciate that they, they tried everything, right? Like they really did. Again, I, I just think that they cast such a wide net well, in there. So and this is an example just of that. Pull out all the stops, right? You yeah. don't know if this is going to be a one-off. You don't know if it's going to be successful. And one of the things that like that's true about design is it doesn't matter. You don't, not everyone's going to like every card and it doesn't matter even if like a lot of people like the same card, but as long as someone likes every card or it, each card is evocative or makes people feel whether, you know, even though sometimes when it, they dislike it, it's so much better to have something for someone than to to to, make, to kind of dilute a card and try to make it please everyone. Like yeah. really extreme cards are tend to, be, you know, be better. And Alpha just, again, they threw everything at the wall, right? Just to see what sticks. And <laughs> Anime Wall really did In this case, stick, the, you know? the wall ate it. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but so many of these things did like, Hypnotic Spectre, right, is a one black black for a 2-2 flying, and an opponent damaged by Spectre must discard a card at random from her, from his or her hand. Also says, ignore this effect if your opponent has no cards left, but, you know. Because <laughs> that but wasn't self-explanatory. If I name a Spectre at random from Magic, it will have something involving discard on it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, 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 the idea of Spectres messing with your opponent's hand, well, that's just, that's just canon now. Yeah. And it's one of those things that was successful. Lord of the Pits, another one you mentioned that earlier, Marshall. It's mm-hmm. a huge flying demon that eats the, your own things during your upkeep, or it, or it punches you. Like so there's common. just so many cards that are like that. Yeah, and maybe some of them didn't work. Like Nettling Imp and Siren's Call were two different cards that forced your opponent to attack, mm-hmm. and if they couldn't attack with their creatures, it was just their creatures were destroyed. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that wasn't. It ended up not being the most fun. Like th- those things ended up not catching, despite Nettling Imp having great art, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, th- those were a swing and a miss, but it's much better to have taken all these swings because basically they took all these swings and they hit like Grand Slam after Grand Slam after Grand Slam, even if there were some like, you know, strikeouts. Exactly. Animate Wall being one of them. Um, well, look, there's you- a million cards that you enchant one of their cards and it does one damage to them on upkeep, right? They have one for artifacts, warp artifact, one for creatures, yes. wanderlust, you know, yep. one for the, the like I said, power leak for enchantments or feedback. Enchant an enchantment and it deals one damage to your opponent on right. upkeep. Yeah, and this is clearly a space that they wanted to, to look into, you know, even it though just- it didn't end up being a, a thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, you guys had a few uh, trivia, just some some fun little facts from from Alpha. I, I think we got to some of this, like you know, mm-hmm. Volcanic Island, Circle Protection, Black, not an Alpha. Cyclopean Tomb had no mana cost. Uh, Elvish Archers it was originally printed as a one two for strike. It was supposed to be a two one. <laughs> okay, I, th- yeah. that did stand out as like, wait a minute, why? <laughs> There's another thing actually. Um, Alpha. I mean, most most Magic players will know this, but Alpha actually had different shaped cards. Um, the, the corners oh, yeah, were right. a little bit more oh, yeah. rounded, and they, they I, I think they changed printers, or maybe I, I can't remember exactly. There was a, there was a reason for it. So anyway, they they, they went to a different uh, corner um, di- uh, setting for for beta, and basically kept that since then. So it's um, if you see an alpha card, they they look a little different. Well, My I assumption remember, uh, is that they playing- they mirrored baseball cards a little closer, or. Because baseball cards weren't as rounded as the alpha, but they, I think they would match up closer with the beta, which, you know, of course, would make them compatible with sleeves and all that kind of stuff. Well, I remember, bef- you know, sleeves weren't even uh, around originally. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the ones the, in the binder, you know. The yeah, nine the, well, yeah, the original things. sleeves are also penny sleeves, just the clear plastic ones. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Having to ask every person in the tournament, the judge, that this is the judge's ruling. I was like, I have an alpha ancestral recall. Can I play it in the tournament? And they're like, if you ask all the people in the tournament and they say yes. And everyone's like, yeah, they're fine with it. So, <laughs> so I, played, I got to play my Alpha Ancestral. I wonder what happened to that Ancestral. I probably shouldn't have gotten rid of it. Oh, my God. Don't even say that. <laughs> Is it really gone? 
Oh, I, this was 20 years ago. I, I, don't know. I went through multiple collections of cards and, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it has long since vanished into, into the into the oh, oh. God. I do have an Alpha Black Lotus right now, though it is so beat up you could barely tell it's Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> that's still cool. There's not that many of those in the world. So. No, there's like 1,400 or something. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you guys have any, you know, we're kind of reached the end here. Did you have any, um, well, we only you know, talked for three hours about alpha. So I guess, yeah, I, guess yeah. I guess I can, I'm, I'm about ready to let it go. <laughs> yeah. I just want to, you know, if you guys have, you know, Ben or, or Luis, if you had anything you wanted to say to kind of cap, put a cap on it. Yeah. I know we've been uh, kind of gushing about alpha. I, I, I just want to really kind of, um, be very, very clear to everybody. It, it, it was not preordained that magic was going to be successful I, I mean, in fact actually if you look at some of the sets that came after like alpha and beta um they they weren't designed very well at all i mean if you have a look at the majority no. of like um antiquities legends legend has so many stinkers in it um, legends is horrendous really bad done. really bad um obviously it has some really iconic cards and people kind of remember legends for all these awesome cards but well, like TBS, the, don't, don't, don't spoil it. We're going to get to Arabian and Legends when we get to Arabian and Legends. <laughs> oh. but, 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 but really, what I want to say is that like, the, the, like the, that Alpha is such a great set is a really a remarkable achievement. And, and like I look at these cards with so much fondness. I would go back and play with them just as they are right now, and I would have a blast playing them. And I think, I think that's one thing that's really, really easy to kind of kind of like, you know, like take for granted is like, oh, you know, well, they must have known what they were doing. They had no idea what they're doing and they really, really just happened to hit all the right notes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know if I, I would say they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> uh, I think that like, if you reverse the order in which sets come out, there could be a disaster for magic. Cause you know, legends was developed in a much shorter time period and didn't involve Richard Garfield, you know, as much, but, mm -hmm. uh, Part of the reason, at least, I hold Alpha in such high esteem is that this was uncharted territory. This was the beginning, and yet it was still super high quality. And I think that's a big thing. It's hard to – I guess it would be hard to overstate it even though I've stated it 50 times in this podcast. It's not like you look at a modern magic set and you're like, wow, this is a hit or this is a miss. It's like you are inventing the wheel and also somehow you nailed it. So it's it's not just that magic, like you said, was de you know preordained to succeed because it certainly wasn't. It just ended up – that the design decisions were that good. And I think that that's why I'm just so impressed with Alpha that even looking back, I'm just really impressed by some of the stuff that just holds up so well today. Whereas, look, the same is just not true of Legends or Homelands or Ice Age, you know, all these other sets that like these got by on the strength of magic, not on the strength of their own <laughs> design. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say before we, we called it a show uh, in relation to this is just, you know, if you go into the third floor at Wizards of the Coast, which is where R&D is, they have, you know, an original, it might be beta, I can't remember, but, <clears throat> you know, they have uh, uncut sheets of alpha and or beta sitting in the hallway. And, you know, I've talked to multiple people that have worked in R&D for a long time, and they say, they will tell you, you know, sometimes, you know, look, they're creatives in there, right? They're trying to come up with new ideas, new directions, new things. They will just go stand in front of that sheet and stare at it and read the cards and, and, and try to draw inspiration from it. And, you know, it's a nice decoration, but they don't use it for that. They don't just go, oh, here's a pretty picture, you know, of a, of a sheet of whatever. They look at it because it it is the progenitor of all these things and they still feel like it has more to give them. And the fact that, you know, this has effectively been iterated on for 25 years now and that it still holds up and that people still go back to it that make the game. I think that, you know, that kind of says it all. Yeah. And I, I like to think that's how M10 came about because I think that set is one of, one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, great stuff, guys. This was super, super fun to go back and take a look at uh, at the original set, Alpha. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to do it. Uh, TBS, thanks for coming on the show again, man. We, we always love having you on. Yeah, it was a blast. I'll, I'll do it anytime you want to. Um, where, where can people find you, um, you know, if they want to say hi or if they want to ask you a question about why Cycloplian <laughs> Tomb doesn't have a mana cost on it or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's easiest to, like, contact me on Twitter. So I'm um, at TBS Dash uh, on Twitter. So TBS letters and D-A-S-H spelled out. So TBS Dash. Okay, I'll put a link to your uh, to your Twitter profile in the uh, show notes as well if people just want to find you that, easy. That's you almost as clean and good of a Twitter phone. handle as LSV. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it must be nice to have three letter <laughs> names. I tried to get TBS, um, but there happened to be a, like a channel with the same name. You. <laughs> yeah, you think so? Turner Broadcasting? Yeah, okay, might have heard of that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, thanks again uh, for coming on. It was really fun. Um, if you want to find me on social media, Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com. All the links and stuff right on the front page for the Patreon, for our YouTube channels, for everything. It's right there. Um, <clears throat> I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by our friends at channelfireball.com. Make sure that if you want to pick up some sweet alpha cards, I mean, I have a couple that are, they're effectively decorations at this point because I just like to look at them. Uh, you know, I don't really have any way to, to use them in a deck currently. Um, but you know, they do have some alpha cards even available over at CFB. And if you want, you can trade in your shiny new standard cards for sweet, old, dark printed, rounded corner alpha cards. Uh, and they'll give you a 30% bonus on anything that you sell back, uh, for store credit to channel fireball. So, uh, make sure you take advantage of that. It's a really good deal. That's going to do it for this one. Uh, we'll be back next week, uh, with more. See you then. So Ooh, I get TBS with this sign off. Yeah, no, I, I, I had a, a cool story that actually is kind of connected to, uh, what we were talking about, uh, with alpha. So I'm, um, this is the story of my, my first pro tour that I qualified for, which, uh, mm. was in, uh, 1997. Um, so I was living in Australia at the time, um, and I qualified via a PTQ, and uh, so I really, really wanted to go, uh, but I was mm -hmm. living at home at the time, and I didn't really have a job, and, but I had saved up enough money to go. Um, so I, because I was living at home, I had to kind of like check with my parents if I could go. Um, mm -hmm. My mom was ha having none of it. She did not like magic. She did not really approve oh, of me no. playing. Um, certainly didn't approve of me going overseas by myself, which I've never ha never had done previously, and I've never been to America. So she said no. So I, you know, that, and that was that. Uh, but you know, I, like I was a bit impetuous, so I, I, I kind of came up with a different. She'd forgotten later, and I, I said, oh, I had a, I, I, I happened to play in an orchestra at the time. I told her. A little white lie that uh, there was going to be an orchestra trip somewhere and instead this sounds like I went a, a tremendous lie a tremendous <laughs> lie. just a bald face lie <laughs> look i really really wanted to play the pro tour so so actually so i so i you know i i told her that and i i, I went on um, my first pro tour trip I, I even brought my violin to my first pro tour trip because i needed to sell <laughs> The, the, the idea. Oh, man, the hard sell. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you I, need I, to I, sell your violin to go to the Pro Tour? <laughs> wow, that is, that, that is, that is desperate. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was in New York. Um, and But this is it's actually not the story of the Pro Tour. I did not do well. In fact, I did o, I went 07 on my, my first tournament, much like how Luis did in his last Pro Tour. Uh -huh. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> um. But so, but actually, because it was my first trip to America, I actually wanted to, you know, do a little bit of sightseeing. And I was really into magic. Obviously, I'd, I'd just gone to my first pro tour, um, and I want. I had actually made some friends at uh, Wizards of the Coast. So um, back in the day, every country had a, a country represent, uh, representative, and I um, befriended the Australian one, and she worked at in Seattle, and so I kind of arranged I said hey would you mind if I came to Seattle and you know I just wanted to see like you know the the you know the place behind the magic so to speak and so you wanted to visit the chocolate factory right right and 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 you know it's 1997 this is actually before Wizards of the Coast had been acquired by uh, Hasbro so things were you know a little faster and looser than um than they do now so it's quite hard to you really have to have a good reason to go into Wizards of the Coast right now. But I just showed up on the doorstep, um, kind of, you know, gave my friends names. Said, Can I come in? And they just let me in. And that was, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, it, it was one of my, my like kind of fondest memories because like I, I got to see all, like I got to see R and D. I got to see some of the stuff they were working on. They weren't anywhere near as secretive as they were now. Um, and actually, I got to meet Richard Garfield like face to face. I mean, that was actually the first time. <laughs> the and they said, "Hey, look, look, um, you know, he, he's a big fan." And he actually took me to his office. He gave like he gave me an 
uh, unlimited starter, and he took an unlimited starter, and we actually just played sealed deck against each other for like an hour. <laughs> what the hell? So Are I, you serious yeah. right now? <laughs> so I got a free like unlimited starter, and and then I, you know, not only that, they actually took me to like they what they called Artist Alley in in the off, and I got to sign all my cards like for all the stuff artists that happened to be there. It was actually just absolutely. Like as you say, it was a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory moment because I got to to be in a, in, and see the people and see how it was made of the game that I I love and I still love right now. So it's it was just a really really kind of remarkable like experience. Wow, what a memory! Well, the, the, and um, yeah, the, the only thing I don't like about that is I I just told that story like a couple weeks ago on the sign off. So it's pretty bad form repeating them like back to back, but. <laughs> I get, all that does is show me that TBS doesn't listen to our podcast. <laughs> Maybe he just doesn't listen to your stupid sign offs. Excuse me, stupid yeah, sign offs? <laughs> Only the highest quality <laughs> sign offs here. <laughs> I listen TBS, sometimes. <laughs> TBS, I loved your story. Thank you. I, appreciate I guess it, it was better straight from uh, the horse's mouth, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one one cool thing about that trip also uh, was so so you know I, I I went to all the stores in the Seattle area just because you know I was there I played Magic and there was one store that was like tucked away I don't know it was really really like on the outskirts of the city and I went to the store because I wanted to, to buy some singles and so I asked them if they had any singles and they said oh no we don't really carry singles but we have a land box over there. And you can just like, you know, if you need some land, you can just take what you want. And so I went in there and there was actually, you know, just normal basic land, except there were 10 Arabians mountains. Ooh. So I don't know if oh you... Oh my God, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those. It was not cheap. No. And so they, yeah, I said, can I have these mountains? And they just let me have them. So I actually got, got wow. 10 Arabians. So down. you fleeced a local store and then fleeced Richard Garfield on your way on the, out the country, huh? <laughs> Look, uh, all, yeah. all predicated on a lie to your mom. Cool oh, yeah. Story. <laughs> mom, mom found out and uh, she was not happy when I got back. <laughs> oh, jeez. Did you? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks, TBS. <laughs> 